Handle Your High with Taddy Yoshi. All right, welcome back to Handle Your High with me, Taddy Yoshi, and I have Sydney Gillian. Hey, Sid, how you doing? Hi, I'm good. How are you? <laughs> good, good. You got your cap on. It's like cold where you're at, I guess, because it, it's cold. Well, it's technically like 82 today, but I'm always cold, but this is the one day. It goes back to 50 tomorrow. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oh, so what's the tem- so you, what's the temperature like in Georgia there? It's good. So it's, it was like 40-ish on Monday, goes up to 70-ish, <laughs> and now we're at 79, and it goes back down to the 40s by Saturday. That sounds like it was like like the kind of weather we had here uh, in Chicago. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, my You're gosh. Exactly right. <laughs> it, it's, been, it's been really funky. Like, I've never experienced anything like this. I ha- we were in that sub that Arctic uh, weather. Like, for one day, it, this was cool. For one day, it was like negative 30 degrees or something like nope. that. And, when I left uh, the house. <laughs> I did. I went worked out. But, um, but I, I, I was impressed because I got, I, now I get to say, on that one day, I lived in the coldest place on Earth because there was no place colder. <laughs> it was, we were colder than Siberia. We were colder than Antarctica. But um, and I got to do that. Do you know what the impimba effect is? No. So it's when you uh, take some hot water and you throw it in the air and it like freezes, the, how the water freezes. Oh. And I, I did that. I posted on social media. It was really awesome. <laughs> That's so, pretty cool. So I made a little fun journey. <laughs> I would I would have liked to have done the bubbles. Like you'd blow bubbles and then bubbles actually freeze in the midair. Now that would have been really, really cool. Yeah. I, I saw some guy do it on, on Facebook. I was like, oh man, that looks fucking rad. <laughs> I, <was> like, <laughs> I like science. but <laughs> Me too. Me too. <laughs> so what's going on? So the, now, by the way, congratulations again. Uh, you Thank did you. awesome at the Olympia and you were, you, you've been really cooking it these last couple, these last two years. Has this, been a, has this been a surprise for you? Um, I always had my eye on the prize. I, since I was a little girl, I knew what I wanted to accomplish. Now, and with the quickness that it happened, I would say that's a little bit more shocking than I thought it was going to be. Um, but once I started getting my foot in the door and really getting how I wanted to go through my preps and everything like that, once I got that set, I figured, I said, okay, it can happen a little bit fast. So I knew that I was on the right path instead of doing a lot of trial and error like I was before. Now, did, now who's your coach now? My coach is Damien now. Okay. So now, did, yeah. when, you start, when did you start working with him? I started working with him after my second Olympia. Okay. So, uh, so your first Olympia was with somebody else? Not with me. Oh, just with you. That's with you. <laughs> yeah. Me and my mom. We were just winging it. it well, that's all right. Let's see what happens today. That's all right. Well, you know, I think I saw your mom at the Olympia and you guys look a lot alike. Yes, my twin. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, because I actually, it was not like, that was not like a, a thing. I was, I was like, man, is that her sister? And the, but then, you, but, <laughs> then when I got close to you, and I was like, okay, okay, it's her mom. <laughs> yeah, she gets that all the time. Really? Yeah, she spit me out. Mm-hmm. That's pretty awesome now. What does she do? What does she, does she do? What does she do for a living? Well, she, um, they do educational innovators, which is the name of their business, where they help kids uh, get ready to go to college and do all the financial aid services and just basically navigating the application process and everything like that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. My, uh, so now last time we talked, well, it was a couple years ago about it, but, um, uh, you were in the midst of studying for something, I think, or something like that. You were transitioning a career or what, what are you doing? What are you doing now with everything? Well, I just graduated from USC, hey, um, in December. So hence, I walk hence, in, hence the Trojan like, cap. Yes, yes, yes. I walked in May, but I technically graduated in December. So basically, I'm just doing the transition from being a student and to try and get into like regular life and just get used to not having something to do every <laughs> single second of the day, um, which I actually prefer. I've grown to love it. That's just how I like to function, just be very busy. Um, but just doing that transition into freelancing and doing public relations and everything like that. So what was your degree in? Strategic public relations. So what does that mean? <laughs> so basically, I can do a lot of different things. Um, once I retire after freelancing, I plan to go into crisis communication. So basically, when the companies start fudging, I come in and help them reboot their reputation and their brand. Oh, that's really cool. So it's sort of like uh, damage control uh, from, a yes. PR, from a PR perspective. Yes. Yeah, so I could even go into politics. It just depends on which realm you want to go into. It oh, can be wow. consumer related. You can work for Johnson and Johnson, P and G. Basically, you work very hand in hand with the marketing and advertising team. So I may also end up working at an advertising firm. Oh, okay. What What is your personal interest? What, do you, what What's your what do you, in your mind? What do you think? Okay, long term. Because it sounds like it, you could almost be a lobbyist too. That, that's exactly what it could happen. I won't never say never, but <laughs> I'll tell you one thing: they get paid good. 
Yeah, that is very, very true. That's very, very true. But um, at, once I graduated, I thought that I wanted to go into sports um, and entertainment publications. But after fulfilling my specialty, I'm kind of like, eh. yeah. that was a, it was it was enough well, for me. So I want to go more into just um, corporate communications. Uh, what what excites you the most about the corporate communications part? Just curious. I think it's it's. It's because hmm. originally I was going back to school. First was med school that I was going to go to my MBA. And that's right. That's what I thought. Here. Yeah, that's what I thought. Right. So when I mix in corporate communication, mixes in the MBA aspect and then the public relations aspect all into one. So it's like artsy and um, not artsy at the same time. So just mix it all together. <laughs> so you get a little. Uh, I, I I think I get it. Um, that's cool. That's very cool. So <clears throat> are you? So now you're transitioning. You're are you? Are you working for somebody? Are you looking for jobs, or what do you? Well, do? I'm freelancing for a while, so basically oh. any projects I want to pick up, I just want to really get my resume stacked, and that way I can go into whatever corporation I want to go into, not at the entry level, because like that little measly <laughs> salary is not going to work for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when it comes to like, uh, especially at like marketing and advertising in co corporate in corporate America, yeah, they you start off so low, so such menial stuff, um, and I hate to say that, but you got. I mean, I, I get it. People have to work their way through, whatever they have to work their way through, but um, mm -hmm. to gain experience. But um, uh, are you are you able to leverage any of the stuff that you've done in the fitness industry, like you know, some maybe some of the companies or people that you've met or, or worked with? I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. Could you do that? I potentially could. I'm definitely working more on. Because there's different aspects of PR. Most of the time, we're behind the scenes doing the production aspect. But my teachers, my professors, and they're, they're all like public relations professionals for 20 years. So they're all like that I could be the one person who would be able to do in front of the camera and behind the scenes. So I can go more so into um, uh, not necessarily corporate communication in terms of the behind the scenes, but it would be more so being a spokeswoman or... Um, that, well, that's the main thing. That would be the most fun for me, just, just to be in front of the camera and just represent the brand versus actually having to do the work behind it. I just that would be cool. Talk for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you need a hat, and I and you could probably you could probably tell me if I'm right, but it seems to me that uh, a lot of the credibility of companies come from the spokesperson, how well they come across and what image they present, and that's really important, especially for public relations, obviously, right? Yes, they, very much so. So I'm just curious. So this is just because I've never talked to anybody in who who got a degree in these kinds of things. So like, mm -hmm. so that's why I'm so interested. Uh, what what kind of coursework did they did you take, and what was your the most interesting coursework that you took that revolved around this kind of PR kind of stuff? I would say my business class was my favorite. Oh. It was the most intense, but it, it, it mixed a lot of aspects of my life all together, which I really liked. Um, I learned a lot about investor relations. We went over everything, everything business and how it relates to PR and how we can basically boost our income by knowing how businesses actually function versus just being artsy, artsy. We have the artsy, but we also know how the finances work. So it, it kind of so the grounded it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, nice. that was my favorite classes. Um, we've done content creation from editing videos, producing videos, films, um, spokeswoman training, uh, advertising and marketing does get thrown in there. We did it pretty much everything. Any skill that you need and to do PR, we did it. <laughs> oh, wow. I, you know, I have always said that if I had another, if I was able to go and have another career, mm -hmm. I would probably go and like to LA film school. I would make movies. Totally. I personally just, I love, I, I still, I, I throw, I'm the guy that throws like Oscar parties and shit at my uh -huh. house. <laughs> I keep track of like who does the score and what directors did this. I just like it because I really believe that movies are our modern day mythology. It's how we tell mm -hmm. our story. Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, I just saw, I don't know if you like movies or not, but I, I, just, do? I just saw um, Glass. And okay, I haven't I, seen it yet. I love M. Night Shyamalan because he takes this art so seriously. Some people don't appreciate some of his movies because they're kind of different, you know, mm -hmm. in some ways. And, but he's like, a, he's got that Alfred Hitchcockian kind of, a, kind of a style to him where he throws a twist at the end. And I really dig that. I really dig it. And uh, so I would love, that's what I would, that, like if I could do another career, that would be what I would do. If I, but, <laughs> Go ahead. The way that you're talking about movies, you could be an entertainment publicist. There is a specific job in my field where we we pitch the movies. So like the Oscar people who are voting on the movies, it's our job to make sure they see the movie, be in front of the movie, set up screenings, everything like that to make sure. And you can make six figures on that. You work six months out the year. Oh wow! <laughs> and that's it. 
<laughs> and your main job is to get your movie nominated and <laughs> ideally to win. A couple, that's, yeah. a couple years ago, um, I had a client in LA who, when I was living in California, she, a wonderful lady, Kim Lee, and her father was a famous director. Um, mm -hmm. And he, like, I think, I forget which big big movies and stuff that he did, I can't remember, but he died, of course, but he, but he was part of the Academy and they would send all the movies that were going out to be uh, like nominated for best picture, best whatever. Yep. They sent him the DVDs before. This is before anybody else. They were released, right? They were these were brand new movies, and she would she would speed me these movies. She's like you got to give them back to me because I just wanted to watch them, right? Like because they were these were movies that were at the movie theater right now. Like, right. So I was like watching at home. I'm watching like all these cool movies. You know? <laughs> I'm like I would totally love to do that. <laughs> See, you might need to pick up PR. Yeah, like no kidding. Kid. <laughs> um, well, uh, switching gears a little bit. What did uh, what's the what, what's what are some other exciting stuff that's going on for you these days right now? Well, the main thing is just really th just that transition and just really getting settled back home because I just moved back from LA. So that's a that move in itself is just an adjustment because okay. once you get used to living in LA, it's different there. It's very different, yeah. and so, and then you come back to the South where you actually have to have manners. It's really nice. It's really <laughs> I like that you said that. <laughs> yeah, and so like now you're surrounded by people who say thank you, and it's like the people who moved here. Uh, right. That's neither here nor there, but for all of us who were born and raised here, we have manners and home training, and it's great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's kind of funny because my, my mom, so my mother and my aunt, my mother's sister, uh, they were, my grandparents, their, their parents were from the South, from uh -huh. Arkansas, and my grandmother and my mother, or my, uh, my aunt and my mother both went to finishing school and like, like walked with books on their heads and stuff like that. So when mm -hmm. I grew, so, so when I grew up, man, there were a couple things that were just no joke. Like, please, thank you. Uh, my hands in my lap when I ate all my uh, table manners, all that stuff was really important. And uh, I didn't understand why, but now, <laughs> now as an adult, I go out and I'm like, man, you guys are ratchet, man. What the, exactly. nobody, <laughs> nobody teach you guys how to like, eat at a table. <laughs> To each his own. I, but I will right. say this. I do appreciate two places I really love going. I love going to Tennessee and I love going to Georgia, especially specifically Atlanta, the Atlanta area. I've never mm -hmm. been too many other places other than Atlanta, so I guess I get... But I, I, you don't need to go anywhere else. <laughs> the, but what I, what I like the... I'll tell you what I like the most. And I fell in love with Nashville as well. I would move mm -hmm. there I would move there in a heartbeat, okay? The people in the South are just so nice. I just... Man, it just so... It resonates so deeply with me. Because mm -hmm. I, I I naturally want to be nice to everybody. I don't have any, you know. And so I, when I interact with people, especially the especially the ladies and and even the guys too, but but especially the ladies. And I resonate deeply with with the feminine side because I was raised by all women. I didn't have mm -hmm. a father, so so I kind of like when I went out there, I was like, man, I would move here in a heartbeat. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> weather's pretty good, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, compared to here, I don't know why. I don't know how I got made my way here. I don't know how right. I mean, most places. I've lived so many places. How many? Where? Where have you lived? You live in California, and where? Philly. Philly. I lived in West Philly for four years for undergrad. Okay. That was an adjustment as well, but I grew to love it. And then L.A. and Phoenix. I lived in Cambodia for a couple months. Whoa, that's awesome. Yeah, I think mean, that's that's about it. The living, yeah. So where was it? So what was the most interesting? What's the most interesting story you have about any of those places that you lived? Just get curious. <laughs> oh, <laughs> people seem to love my lift stories from LA. I have a lot of lift really? stories. Really? Why? Are they crazy? I, the, crazy. The people that because people in LA are already an intricate breed in themselves. <laughs> They're very, very interesting types of people. Lots of different variety of craziness. Um, so when you do lift. If you do a shared lift, oh man! I was a student, so I was trying to keep my budget together. I was like, a three dollar ride versus a ten dollar ride. I'm taking three dollars, but you end up riding with strangers. Right, you get to know and some interesting people. Yeah, you get your money's worth. A lot. Of, I've had lift drivers cussing people out on the phone, cussing passengers out. Damn. It was. It's. It's. Yeah. It's just a lot. A lot of stories that are just. Yeah, I rather not ever relive them. I'm glad to be past my lift days. I, uh, but it was a lot. I know what every time I was when and now I, when I, once when the rideshare became really popular several years ago, I started using it because I was used to taking taxis and stuff, and I hated taking taxis because every time I get into a taxi, I felt like this dude doesn't want to drive me nowhere. He doesn't care. He don't want to talk. He doesn't want. But when I do the lift, I never take a shared lift because mm -hmm. I've never yeah, tried that. I'm like, I just, I, I, it's not that I, I just never tried it. 
But I did take, but when I do lift, I always get these interesting lift drivers. I, could, I get a chance to talk to them. Mm -hmm. I've only probably had one that was like kind of, and, and I've had lots of it. I just tend to find myself in these situations where, I, and I, I leave it up to the universe. I say, you know, and I, when I get in there, I just start talking. And I, I don't know, they probably think I'm fucking strange. <laughs> <laughs> But I always have these interesting stories. I always find these interesting people. That's what I like most about right, ride shares these days is that it, you get people that actually want to give you a ride. I mean, yeah. At least it feels that way. Right, right, right. <laughs> Uh, what, what about, I'm, I'm interested, what, Cambodia. I never would have thought you'd have been to Cambodia. That's Well, it was because I was on Survivor. So we had to live there for a very, very long time. Well, too, it seems like a long time when you're not eating any food. So, <laughs> so, so tell me about that. What was that about? Um, it was after my first Arnold, so I literally got off stage. A week later, I was in Cambodia, starving again. And I was just like, like okay, damn. <laughs> escalated quickly. Um, but yeah, it was amazing. It was really, really hot. I loved the people, though. We didn't see them. I didn't see the majority of the people until the show was over. Um, if you got eliminated sooner than I did, then you saw a lot of people. You were able to go out about and see everything. So I didn't really see much, but... It was nice living there. I love the weather. I love waking up on the beach, and it was I didn't just nice. Know, I didn't know you were on that show. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So what was yeah. that? What was that like? <laughs> it was amazing. I would always go back, but I can't go back until my career is done with bodybuilding because I ended up losing twenty six pounds. Oh my I gosh. was a little string bean. Um, I came <laughs> back. My mom was like, "Oh my god," because I had to do Chicago Pro to qualify for the Olympia that year, and she was like, "You have seven weeks," and I was like, "Well, I'm gonna just lift heavy as possible, <laughs> eat all the food, and hope for the best." <laughs> I didn't. I never understood why anybody would want to go on some of these shows where they just torture themselves. I get it. I get it. It looks like it's kind of some piece of it's is kind of fun. But what I the, the show that puzzles me is that naked and afraid. I'm like, yes. what the? I'm like, what are you talking? Like, what? That's just. I don't know. It just seems like you're just really begging for like viewers or something. I don't know. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I would never go. On I like that nah, one. Nah, nah, nah. No. I like the challenges and the fun aspect and the strategic aspect. Of Survivor, that's the most fun. Part. Is it hard? You, yes, it's hard. Yes, it dep It wasn't as hard of a transition for me because I'm naturally a survivor, so like I can figure out what I need to do, and I also know how to. I, I end up in public relations because of the show. Oh really? Like, okay. Yeah, and it's because of my intro, um, my like, my essays. They were like, "Well, how did you even stumble across this?" And I was like, "Well." I almost won a show, and I was like, it was based off of a whole bunch of random people from a whole bunch of different backgrounds <laughs> that knew nothing about me, but it was how you interact with all different kinds of people and make them believe the message that you're giving out. So oh. it ended up being like PR 101, and I was like, hey, it's something I ended up being good at, but it was it was a great experience. Nice. Great experience. That's pretty cool. That's pretty. I, I, I yeah. did, maybe I did hear that, but I don't. It didn't stick out in my head. But then again, mm. I don't watch a lot of TV. <laughs> Yeah, you got to watch the season. It was fun. It was a lot, a lot of drama. You have, you'll have to. It's probably on YouTube, I imagine, right? It's on Hulu now. Oh, okay. You have to send me a link or something, or I'll, uh, I'll definitely check it out because I'd like to see it. Yeah, it's season thirty-two. Season thirty. Okay, okay. I'm gonna put mark that down. Season thirty-two. <laughs> um, what? Uh, so now, this last uh, this. What was? I, I have to ask. Like, it seems like you your physique has improved quite a bit in the last couple of years. Um, like, so what was, did you do anything different? Like what was, what was your focus this last year? Just out of curiosity. Um, my coach just believes in like an overall package. So we wanted everything just to be better. Like literally, we're so OCD that we we're like perfectionists to the point of like, we're like yin and yang. We're like, all right, something can always be better. We're like, we're going to fix something. Rather at just training a body part more than the other or dieting longer that we just whatever needs to happen we make it happen so i think for this last oh it was just about overall being better we wanted to come in full but we wanted to still be lean um for me i was focused on my hamstrings because i always wanted hamstrings i never i always had the shape of the hammy but it was never any detail and i was <laughs> like god why why me so i was determined like the, i think it was the last three weeks going into it like we would because you could see them when I worked out. We would always see them moving. We knew they were there. But for some reason, like the way I was posing, they weren't coming out. So that was our main focus to those last couple of weeks. And then once we finally saw a glimpse, I was like, I think I got it. <laughs> and we started screaming. <laughs> and then so now it's, that's all she wrote. But that was the last little finishing touch that I, that I wanted personally. Because I always, it just brings the physique together when like you get that nice little bit of definition in the hamstring after. Because I had the glutes, but I wanted everything under the glutes to just like 
pop too. <laughs> now it's kind of funny because your physique, you're, you don't have, you're not. I don't think you're. Now you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think you're naturally like a, a really super muscular kind of a physique. It's very linear. Um, very, it's a very nice shape, but it's very linear from the sense, especially your legs and stuff. But you've put on really wonderful muscle and you've developed it uh, really nicely, and so that it fits together. Everything fits. Everything fits together really beautifully, and then you, you're very polished. Uh, your your presence and uh, your presentation is very polished, and that really sets you apart on many, on many, many way, in many ways on stage. And so, it get, what I, my I think for a lot of ladies, I don't know if, they, if a lot of figure uh, ladies, uh, you talk to them, if, they, if, you, if you give them hope or not, but I tell them, like, look, you're a good example of somebody who could build a championship physique, a world-class mm-hmm. championship from really, not, I won't say from ground zero, but we all start mm-hmm. from somewhere ground zero. Yes. <laughs> but you, can, you, can, you don't have to be born with this natural sort of like, you know, um, this natural shape, this natural mm-hmm. muscularity. You can actually mm-hmm. build this thing. Yes. You can actually have a vision. Did you, now when you first started, because I remember talking to you before, and I think it was you, 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 when you started in figure, you kind of, you did you have a vision for what you wanted to create? No. Okay. I just knew, I was like, put on some muscle. That was it. <laughs> and didn't, didn't, don't I remember, didn't, didn't, if I remember correctly, was it some of your family that competed also or something? Yeah. My, both my parents compete. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. What... They still compete. Um, this, my mom, last time she competed was last year. She did masters nationals last year. Nice. How'd she do? Um, she plays. I think towards the end of the pack, but she was just really trying to get back on stage. It was her first year back after um, she had taken maybe like a two year break. So it was her first year back and she was trying to get everything together. And yeah, so it was good for her to just get back on stage. Where's your focus? Where's your focus right now in your, in your training, in your training? Where's your focus in your training right now and your everything? Oh, just overall coming better than no. Okay. Every every time I show up, I want it, something needs to be different. Now you're, gonna, just, well, you're not going. You're not going to compete uh, at the Arnold. You're, uh, you're yes, I am. Oh, you are. Okay, I wasn't sure. I looked. I didn't look at the list um, completely. It was, I think it's a fairly long list. I think there's 20, 30 girls, right? No, it's. Uh, I can't 14. remember. Oh, really? Maybe I'm. Maybe I'm 14. thinking of something else. Maybe I'm thinking of the. Beach. Maybe you're talking because classic men's physique and women's physique. Their their lists are. Like okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I I briefly yeah. looked at it. I should. I probably should look at it since I'm reporting on it. But. <laughs> <laughs> so so you're definitely the favorite then. Absolutely definitely mm-hmm. the favorite. Who who uh what are you? Is there anything different that you're doing for this this for this uh, prep as opposed to the Olympia this last year? I mean, the same mentality is always do better, right. do more work, work harder, push harder, just be better. And so what, once if you take those steps every single day, you're bound to have a different package on stage. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what I look like until I get on stage. That's pretty much year. That always happens. I'm like, oh, that looks nice. Like it'll be after the show until I know. <laughs> but I, I, I mean, it's gonna be, it's gonna be. I think the main difference for me is I'm getting older. So as I get older, the muscle maturity does give a different look, which I'm loving. So that's that's gonna be really cool to see what what it looks like on stage because I've been training for over 13 years now. So it's gonna be interesting to see how it how it looks as the years go by and the training keeps going. So when you uh, what's I work with so many athletes, and when it comes to prepping for shows, and when it comes to just developing their physique, or even just clients losing body fat, a lot of them have their the biggest challenges that I see as a coach, and I've seen this for gosh, I've been coaching for almost 30 years. Um, the biggest challenge I see most people have is mindset. It's the, where their mind is at. And um, how, what is your mindset like? You have such a wonderful temperament. I've always loved to talking to you. You have a beautiful smile and you're always Thank warm you. and you're always sincere. Um, but what, but I, you have to have those challenging moments. We all do, right? We, and what's, what's, what's the hardest for you and how do you deal with that? Mine, I had a lot of practice um, being a collegiate runner, but even before college, I think my base really came from my track coaches in in high school Uh, because most of the time, that's when I was tried the most in terms of like educationally, life-wise, just training with bodybuilding. I had a lot going on and just my, my track coach in those years, he was very, very hard on me. I've never had a coach as hard on me as he is. But he ended up turning me into a woman I am today. So literally, I could handle everything I can handle because of him. Oh, so wow. like, whether it's moments where I, he, he would curse me out every, he was he's one of those coaches who just <laughs> likes to curse all the time. There was never a practice in the two years that we were together that he did not call my name. So like, it'd be instances where like, because he he knew I could be better, but I wasn't pushing myself. And so once he saw that, like he would he would get irate if he saw me like <laughs> just like pussyfooting around. He was like, okay, come on, say what are you doing? So he would cuss me out. 
but I never remember this day. This is one of the, the main turning points. Like, literally, I would just sit in the locker room and cry before every practice because his practices were that intense. Like, I had, I had practice anxiety. Like, it was bad. And I was just like, why am I doing this to myself? Why? But that's when I developed my mentality of never quitting because I said, every day, I said to myself, as soon as you run one 400, which I hate that race, I hate it with a passion, as soon as you run one, you cannot quit because then that energy would have been wasted. Ah, uh, okay. So Good that's much. how that's that turned me into this now, like because I had to I had to have something to push from back then. Because I was like, why am I? Why, why am, I, am doing I doing this? <laughs> this is why. <laughs> um, but and, and then at the main turning point. So like that was my base. And so I was like, you can't quit. You can't quit. And it was one day. It was raining outside. I was dead tired. I just missed my time. He was like, well. And I just, I knew what was coming. And I just started crying. As soon as I crossed the finish line, I was like, oh, I just missed it. I missed it because they're calling out. And he was like, all right. This is how he talked to me. All right. <laughs> well, when you suck them tears up, get the fuck back on the line. That's literally how he talked to me. And, literally, and I was like, You're like, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I did, and I made the time. But it was it was him who, he, he shaped me into being able to handle the workload I can handle. Like, there's no coach after that has ever given me that workload to able to, to be able to hold it and see what see what it gave me at the end of it. So that's, that was been the main takeaway from that one. But he set me up to be where I am now. Because once I made it through that, I said, oh, shit, I can make it do anything. Like, Isn't that <laughs> I funny? I was scared. I was <laughs> legitimately scared. I was petrified every day. So that so so training for like the Olympia is nothing then <laughs> compared no, to that compared no. to that. <laughs> it's much more peaceful. I don't get cussed out. That's it. <laughs> um, but it definitely it 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 changed me for the better. I will say I I definitely appreciate him for for being so hard on me because it does make a different athlete when you go through. We that's not that's only one of the stories. The amount of work like I was tortured. I was just like oh. <laughs> Uh, I would, it, would to the, it would be to the point where, like, it would be, like, the last week of prep every day. That's what the feeling would be. Oh, like, damn. I'd be that tired every day. <laughs> like, and I was a child. I was literally 14, 15, dead tired. Like, there was no energy left in me. <laughs> so, but I, it, it worked out. It worked so, you, out. you it sounds like you draw on some of that, that uh, those experiences yes. Uh, to, to, yes. Because, but, because that created my foundation. And so that's why I always I can always go back to those moments where I made it through those instances. Well, now, what would you tell somebody now who's having a rough prep? It's, they think it's tough, man. I don't got the time. I, I got all these excuses why they can't, can't, can't. They got all these excuses why they can't do this and they can't achieve this. What would you tell them? Because this is the, this is the, stuff, I, this is the stuff I, I struggle with. I, struggle, I said, look, because I, I really try to impress that this is all about your mindset, your, your yes. approach, your perspective. And you just don't, they don't realize that they haven't had these tough experiences like you had to really make you realize that you are tougher than you think. Yes. <laughs> yes. I think for people who come out the gate with excuses, I always ask them, like, do you want to compete? You don't have to compete. It's not for everybody. So just don't. If you're going to, if your first instinct is to be like, I can't do A, B, and C because of A, B, and C, you don't want to compete. Because if you wanted to, you do it. Right. No matter what. That's right. And I think it takes seeing people and having people be out there doing what they're claiming they can't do. So whether it's the fit moms or the people with in, um, injuries or the people going to school, there are people who have already done that and performed at high levels. So that means you can do it too. You just got to want to do it. I think a lot of people think that they're, you're absolutely right. And I think a lot of people think that they're, that in their mind, we always see ourselves as this exceptional case. Like, but my life is different. Right, I right, have these right. kids and I have this job. I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, don't, I do realize that people have, people do have, from their perspective, it's rough. Yeah. But, but like I said, I don't think they realize that you can, you are tougher than you think. Yes. You know, and you can do more than you think. But if right. you don't believe you can, Forget it. You're done. That's exactly right. And that's why when I meet a lot of people, I always tell them the key is focusing on yourself. You can't focus on what the next person is doing, how long they're in the gym, what's happening, A, B, C. That has nothing to do with you because uh -huh. you're not going to change anything that's going on over there. So focus on yourself, bring your best you, and get on stage. People make it bigger than it should be. Just keep it, keep it right here. Look in here. If you lose, figure out why you lost. Don't look outside for why you lost. What Boy, did you do inside? That is such good advice. I mean, I hope a lot of other competitors are listening to that piece because 
man, this the this the the notion of self comparison, this self comparison to other to other people is just, and then it defeats them before they even get there. Yes, and it's like man, like, and they and then it, and it also stymies you from getting better, like you said, you, because it's like, oh my god, like I can't, like uh, how did how did you come to that 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 perspective? I think well, it came back to track because I noticed it was um really big in college because. I was a big fish in a little pond in high school. Then when you get to college and everybody's fast, (laughs) the times change. It's like, okay, this escalated quickly. But when that happened, I had to take a step back and be like, well, why are you running in the first place? And I was like, yeah, you may not be the fastest person anymore, but you love this sport. So you're going to go out and bust ass every day. You may be the slowest person on your track team or close to the slowest person because everybody's fast as hell. But... (laughs) What are you going to do? Because you love the sport, so you're still going to compete. So you just try your best, show up every day, and show out for what you can do. And then let your PR speak for themselves and find those records within yourself. And so track helped me the most with that because, one, is it's, it's kind of a life or death situation because I was a hurdler. So if you focus on oh anybody gosh. else, you're going to bust your ass. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that's the, where I, the key to where I learned the blinders because – if you don't have blinders, you're going to run the pace of somebody else's race. You don't run their race. So this not, is your race. Oh, nice. Yes. So, so then I took that and translated it over into my regular life because my coach was like, why, why are you running like her? That's not, that's not how you run. So I had to remember, okay, stay in, stay in your lane. <laughs> Focus on what you're doing and look straight ahead. And so that, that literally track is life. I always say that track is life. That is one sport that translates over to everything, and, and you, that that helped me so much. How do you now in, now in figure and bodybuilding in the sport of in the this in the sport of bodybuilding? How do you keep how do you stay in your lane? Because there's because you're in on a you know you're obviously competing against some other other ladies on stage, mm-hmm. and uh, I believe the other lady uh, is a her, was a uh, track and field athlete too who uh, was close to you this last Olympia, mm-hmm. <laughs> and. and um, Great physiques, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful physique. Uh, but mm-hmm. um, like, how do you, how, how do you, what, what modality or what tools do you use to stay like? Because it'd be hard to look over and go, wow. Because I'm sure you look at other, some of the physiques and appreciate some of the yes. things that, and go, because I mean, gosh, you, how could you? How could you not? Right. So, um, how do you stay in your lane with the, with all that going on? I definitely appreciate physiques, but I also don't look at them going into shows. Because okay. that has nothing to do with me. Oh, exactly. <laughs> it's like I'm not magic gonna pour more into the next person. So like, especially because I notice that people they're scroll and scroll and scroll on Instagram. I'm like, that's not helping you. That's not gonna help you. And neither are those filters that they're putting on their pictures. So <laughs> keep that in mind. <laughs> I mean, people, that's not reality. It's not reality. <laughs> and so I think not. I don't. Yeah, I don't look on Instagram. I don't look outside of myself. And that's the key thing because I'm at the end of the day. I'm gonna be my own motivation. I don't need external motivation. And so I know that what I want to be, and I know what I can create. And I think the also the key thing is knowing that I'm me. I'm not somebody else. So I'm going to create my physique. I'm not ever going to look like the next person. I'm going to look like me. Because yes. even if you go through like me, Candice and Latori, we have similar physiques, but they're not alike. Right. If you really look at it, we're not alike. We have very different pieces that are very different. And so that's the part that I always draw uh, drew on. And I was like, well, I'm me. Make my best pieces my best pieces. And that's all I can do. And hope for the best. <laughs> <laughs> it's out of my hands at that point. You know that is a very um, that approach that that attitude that perspective about your about you focusing on just you and that is such wisdom. I hope I really do hope because uh, man, if, uh, uh, if if some of my competitors could just hear that from somebody who's ach- who's achieving, uh, because man, it's so that is hard for people. We have this. We want to compare. We want to compare not only just in the sport but also in our life, our yep. looks. Uh, our how much money we make, what things we have. Um, it's like you know. We're not in. Com- we're really not in competition with anybody. Exactly. You know, it's like exactly. we're just out. I, I really firmly believe that when you let go of that stuff, then it's easier to be to 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 achieve your own greatness and your own yep. brand of greatness. And yes. because now you're free. Because I think you, you you hinted on it that when you are looking at somebody else, you're running their race. They're the leader. You're the follower. You are exactly. not leading now. <laughs> That's exactly right. You're distracted. Exactly. So, in the way, in the only way to achieve is to be totally focused, like you said, totally focused on you, on where you're going, and what you're doing. Did that? Did these lessons come from your first coach, or did you well, kind of acquire them along the way? 
I would say he he taught me my my mental toughness. Okay. When it came to learning how to finesse my situations and learning what worked best for me in terms of competition, I learned that along the way. Definitely learned that along the way through trial and error. Like so, looking in other people's races, looking A, B, C, and D everywhere else but where I need to be looking. Um, <laughs> I learned my lessons that way, and then after a while, I just got comfortable just focusing on myself, but I've never been one to really, outside of the track, just in regular life, I'm never one to really compare, because I don't, <laughs> this sounds bad, I don't care, I don't care, like, I don't, no. that has nothing to do with me, I don't care. Like, well, you know what, I think, I, I, I posted a thing on this on Instagram a while back, I was a little pictorial, and, um, whoops. Um, oh, there you go. <laughs> it was, it said um, that uh, comparison is the thief of joy, mm-hmm. and, uh, and it's also the thief of victory most of the time. So, mm-hmm. like, so while we have to be compared, like you said, not my job, not my job to do that. My job is to be yeah. the best I can be. It's like, and that's in, that's in my way. I love mm-hmm. that's just such that is just such good wisdom. I, I, I try to relay this to, to my athletes over the years because I mm-hmm. fell victim of the same crap when I was competing mm-hmm. for many years. Mm-hmm. And by the time I realized so that <laughs> my competitive career, I was already reaching the end of it. I didn't want to compete anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but now I try to give this this wisdom to them, and I hope they I hope many of them are listening to it because wow, mm-hmm. it's that's. To have that kind of, and I know you, um, I know you, you, you think you're getting old, but I'm, I'm, you're not that old. And so to have this kind of wisdom, it, it, it's uh, to me, it's a, it's a hallmark of a champion. It's, it's what, it's the reason why you're where you. It's a big reason why you, you are where you are. And I think I really, really um, hope that people listen to that piece of it because that's so important, not just in competition, but in life in general. And I think mm-hmm. I don't know about you, but I sense lately in the last probably 10, 15 years, especially 10 years, that this, that our culture is evolving uh, in some ways, probably a lot due to social media in, in, yes. in, in good ways and bad ways, but yes. in some of the good ways, I only focus on the good stuff. You know me, I mm-hmm. only focus on mm-hmm. So the, some of the good ways is that we're, that some of these great ideas like this and these great things are really able to reach so many more people. Right. And, and so I, there are, people are hearing these things and I see it like, I'm big on mindfulness, meditation, all that kind of stuff. Yes. I don't know if you do or not. Same, yes, uh, I do. So, every so day. <laughs> I, I, you know, and I, I, I meditate every day, at least once, usually t- sometimes twice. I do, and I, and I do a lot of interpersonal uh, development. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, looking inside. What do you do? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, what kind of things well, do you do? I do. I do my meditation as well. Um, people, people think that meditation is just sitting down and crossing your legs. Like <laughs> they don't realize, like you can be mindful in every single thing that you do. And there's different types of meditations that usually they make them fit your life. So whether that's while you're eating a meal, whether that's while you're walking down the street, whether yeah. you're doing your cardio, there's times when you can say, "Hey, am I here in this moment? In this now, right? Exactly. Yeah. And that's what I do. People always they laugh when I say I don't talk while I'm eating because I'm meditating. Like, let me, let me taste the flavors that I'm here. I'm doing, so every time I'm eating, I'm in the present. Like, I love my food, yes. Oh, man. But I'm in the present because I'm knowing exactly what tastes like what. That's why I can tell that there's too much salt. Oh, I sprinkled a little bit too much in here or there's a little too much onion powder. I can tell because I know what I, what I feel like every time I have that experience. And so if you, if you eat six meals a day, you've already meditated six, ta- six times that day. That's right. Absolutely. That's a good point, way to put it. That's, it. That's I never, what I do. I like that, man. I just love your approach. I, I just, you know, I wish so many people, other people, because I, it's taken me a lifetime to come to a lot of these things. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think I've always been a joyful, joyful person and a positive mm-hmm. person, but now mm-hmm. I'm focused on the, a lot of mindfulness techniques the last six or so years, mm-hmm. and it's changed my life absolutely, mm-hmm. but absolutely. And I, and if I, I wish, well, I guess I can't say I wish because I'm so happy where I'm at. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, for, so I'm so glad to see. But this is the kind of stuff that I. I see coming up, um, having an impact on the younger generation coming mm-hmm. up and more and more people, even people who are, there are more and more people, they're doing studies on meditation and how it affects mm-hmm. the brain. And it's like, mm-hmm. uh, if I, uh, the second thing I would do if I was going to go back to, if I was going to go back to school today, I would go and I would probably study, I would probably do research on meditation and, and how it affects the brain and brain mm-hmm. plasticity and how we create with this. How, you know, cause mm-hmm. I, I'm a believer, as everybody knows who knows me, energy and we're all just energy. Yes. And yep. look, at we, if we need to control our vibration and how we do that is through what we feel and how we do that is by what we think about. Yep. And it's like, so I'm all about controlling my thoughts, all about yes. managing my yes. thoughts. Yes, like, so, <laughs> so that's, and I know that it produces success. It produces change. So it sounds like my, I, I'm so glad I, that you talk about this so freely because some people think it's like, like you said, some people think it's like a spiritual thing. And 
in some ways. Whatever you want to call yeah, it. Exactly. You need to do it. Yeah. People don't understand. And like, and, but the thing is, they'll call, they'll be like, oh, that's too spiritual for me. Or, or that's something I can't do. But do you want to get better? Because clearly what you're doing right now isn't working. <laughs> so why not try something else that's actually going to benefit you? And the funny thing is, because I um, before I went on Survivor, I had to have a heart test. And so, um, like a it, cardiac, it should, like, a, like a cardiac. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So I had to have an echo test because I have an enlarged heart because my heart. Cause, well, most athletes from sprinting, yeah, probably from being a sprinter. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, but my doctor failed to mention that before he just told me my heart was enlarged. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? Like, what? I got a heart problem? Exactly. Yeah, I love a lot. <laughs> oh no, it's common. It's common. I'm like. Okay, thanks. Start with that. Lead with that. <laughs> but um, so I went for I went for a stress test because they couldn't really read my uh, my graph. And so like you get on this treadmill, they get your heart up as high as possible. And so once you get off the tre- the treadmill, they they ask you they're like take your heart rate. And so she was like, okay, I want to take a couple of breaths and see how long it takes you to mellow out to basically for your heart rate for, to drop. Go back to the resting rate. Kid you not. Two breaths. <laughs> that's was, awesome oh god i've never seen anything like this she's like how i think yoga because i can slow my heart rate in a second if i feel like i'm getting anxious take a deep breath like you go through a breathing exercise yep. like, all of these things work especially for people who get stressed before stage these I, breathing I mean, I, exercises I was, are gonna help you relax i, 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 I was telling you I, I just did some instagram live stuff and talking about breathing techniques i tell my mm-hmm. clients i think sometimes i think my clients go okay yeah yeah Ted, yeah Ted. <laughs> i'm like look stop for i tell them to set their alarm Three times a day, I want you to stop for one minute and take yeah. deep breaths. I said, because you need to manage your stress. You need to lower yes. all these hormones. I said, these, are, these things are destructive to your, to your, rep, your recovery. They're destructive to your life. And, yep. and, and, and more importantly, if you're not back to center, you don't have, you got, you got to bring yourself back to center to be able to be, to be a creator. If you're not, you're being a responder. Yep. And you're responding to life and you can't create when you're responding. You know, so, so we are conscious creators. We mm-hmm. consciously evolve, and it's, it's important to be in control of that at every second, as much as we yes. can. So yes, I, it, you are such an enlightened individual. You you have such Thank a you. wonderful perspective. I live really. It's hard for me to. I, I guess I'm, I do so much teaching of it that I, it's rare that I come across someone who actually is employing this, and she and they're seeing the success from it. And all. What's the most? When, when did you come to some of these techniques? Did you? What, did, or, did your mom bring it to you, or did you? Or did you just learn about it somewhere else? Well, I found that when I was younger, I wouldn't say I had anger problems, but I was more angry. So it would be like really? I was a very quick snapper. Like I had no filter. So if something was <laughs> stupid, it would just, I, it would just, I would just attack That's dumb. very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and so as I got older, I said, um, my mom was like, you're going to need to, to, to figure this out because in order to make it through life, you're going to need to have a little more tact. And so I said, okay, what's going to help me? That was what's told, me I think that down? was told to me in college. Let's see, you see, look. So mine was like, I think it was through elementary school, middle school. And then once I was about to go to college, I, I met this lady, my, my first yoga teacher named Miss Kamiko. And she brought me in. She was her Japanese. Lady. Well, no, no, no. She's black. Okay, because Kamiko is a Japanese. might have. Japanese. Well, just, I'm just responding to the name. Kamiko is a Japanese. Right. Well, she may, well, shoot. Well, I don't know. I think that to me. So. <laughs> but um, she swept me under her wing, and that was right before I left for before undergrad. And then, so I've been practicing yoga at this point for probably about ten years now. And I think that some that learning how to be present that started then. At first, it started just as a workout. And then after a while, I started noticing the changes in how I handle situations, and I get I just. And top of like maturing and going through life, I notice a difference from yoga. So I can notice even to this day if I don't do yoga or if I don't meditate, it's not gonna be good. Like it'll, I, it'll yeah. come back in a heartbeat. <laughs> I I, uh, I notice it if I if I don't meditate, if I skip one day, it's okay. If I skip yeah. two days, I might, but I can I can, I can feel it too. I can feel like I get a little more. Uh, I'll be a little more sharp, yep. a little more edgy. And yep, it's like yep, I, yep. I don't like that when I start feeling. That, I'm like whoa, whoa Tad. That's not you, bro. That's not you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, <laughs> I don't like mm-hmm. it. I don't like feeling. I always want to feel joyful. I always want to feel yes. good. I recognize my negative emotion. I recognize it. I try to do it. I don't know about you, but my process is when I experience it, I, I immediately in my mind, I step back and I, yep. I, and I become, and I just want to observe. Mm-hmm. And, then I, and, I, and then when I do that, then I could go, okay, then I say to myself, Tad, return back to center. Yes. And then I, go, then I can make a good decision. Yes, the key is recognizing it. It's not pushing it away. You right. got to see it, be aware that it happened, and then move on. Yeah, in the beginning, I wanted to fight it. I'm like, oh, what the fuck is this all about? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. There's so much of our biology there. Actually, I'm reading this really great book called uh, The Laws of Human Nature by... Um, oh, I need to... Let me write that down. <laughs> it's a really... It just came out. Um, okay. His name's Robert Greene. I don't know if you know Robert Greene. He's, he's been New York bestseller. Um, he wrote uh, 48... What is it? The 46 uh, Laws of War or something like that. In fact, he's, okay. He counsels like all these dignitaries and all these top people in the world but he um he wrote with this book it's really almost like a textbook i mean it you're gonna okay. you're gonna really like it because i love it and i'm only a fifth of the way through it it's a, kind of a okay. thick book about 500 pages Good. Of, the bigger the better yeah. Come back to keep me entertained the rest of this prep <laughs> you, you're, you're you're gonna fall in love with it i know it um but you should start this they, he, he talks about how to evaluate people and and how all these subtle uh, uh, the, that most of our communication is nonverbal. It's yes like 90 something percent <laughs> And that what people say, that most people, that we've gotten this habit as humans to disregard the, the physical cues that people give off about what they're, mm. and, and, and only listen to their voice. And, and you know, like people can tell you anything. Like, and, yes. and it's not that they mean to deceive you, not intentionally. They don't mean by ill means. They mean to tell you what they intend. They mean to tell you what the best picture of them. They mean to tell you all these things, but it's not really necessarily who they really are. Right. And so he's, and it's really fascinating. So I, I would be interested to hear your input when you read it because I'm reading this going, oh my God, I'm sitting there psychoanalyzing myself and like mm -hmm. looking at other <laughs> he, And he talks about uh, some of these behaviors that we, and, and he uses very concrete um, examples in history with people okay. and things. So you'll really enjoy it. I hope, I'd really like to get your opinion. I, uh, but to me, human nature, this goes right hand in hand, like mindfulness and things in mm -hmm. behavior. I'm a really, I've been a big study of human nature and behavior specifically mm -hmm. because of my career. I have to work with behavior. And mm -hmm. people, the biggest problem that I find that people have when they kind of, they, what they identify is they want to change a behavior, but they can't. They try, mm -hmm. try, 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 but they can't. I'm like, because for me, I don't know about you, but for me, when, it, when I started bodybuilding at 15, I, it was a radical change in my lifestyle, but mm -hmm. I, did it, I flipped it like a dime. I was like, because I had such strong desire. Same. So I was like, nope, this is it, man. And my, and my brother, my identical twin brother, he's exactly the same way as me. When he wants to do something, when, I, we, when we decide, then it's like, it's, we, it's, I call it, I tell my clients, I said, look, this is the metaphor I use. I say, look, it's like flicking a switch. Yep, right. that's exactly right. It's like you just got to turn the switch on. When the switch is on, you have to also set the parameters when you decide, when you know you're going to decide to turn it off. Mm -hmm. so, so like when I started prep, they like, oh, why, how do you, why don't you cheat on your preps? I never cheated on a prep. The first mm -hmm. one I did. First one, I had Hershey mm -hmm. bar and I said to myself, I'm never going to fucking do that again. <laughs> but I said, I, 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 said I, I call it flicking the switch. I turn mm -hmm. the switch on. When the switch is on, I tell my, myself in my head, nothing except barring death is going to, is going to stop me from deviating from my plan. Until, until that switch goes off. And they're like, oh, well, what if this happens? Doesn't matter. Yep. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. So you have to set those rules. You mm -hmm. know, like, and I can honestly say that I didn't, I never did. I never, uh, never deviated from my, my plans. So my plans were not always perfect, but mm -hmm. I didn't deviate from what I planned. That was right. the point. And so I learned, that's the only way to learn, right? The only way to truly learn how to do this stuff. What, is, what, kind, is that the, what kind of strategy do you use in a prep? That's exactly the same strategy. I'm a planner to the T. Once I once I get set, I'm set. That's it. And so I think for me is like some I'm on a year round plan. So I never <laughs> deviate. I don't for the last three years. I think the last no last two years, last solid two years, it's been on a plan year round. So whether it's a show or not, oh. as soon as I get off stage, so you don't get, on a plan. You don't give your. Do you give it any time to like? Cheat and stuff like that. Oh, I have cheat meals every week. Okay, good, 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 good. So, good. like, so that's so that <laughs> another reason. Like, it's literally, legitimately a lifestyle. So, okay. I literally get off stage, I'll have my cheat meal that night, clean it back up, and then I'll do like a two day cheat only. It has to be right after a show, and then I'll be back on a plan till the next show rolls around. So, basically, like, four days out of the year, I eat whatever, and then during <laughs> the week, everything is clean, but that's worked the best for me. But in terms of like planning, like, once the plan is set, the plan is set. So it's funny that you said there was one time it was a show I wasn't going to be able to do. Um, this is before I entered the NPC. Uh, I was like, okay, I'm going to do this show. But then my, something, there's a scheduling conflict. As soon as the conflict was like mitigated, I said, oh, I'm doing the show. Could you not? <laughs> 30 days later, I was on stage. I had literally not been on a diet the whole time. I was like, oh, I got 30 days. If I can do it, now I'm going. Um, and so I switched that. But even... You gotta just want it because it was the yeah. day I think my boyfriend had just gotten into an accident. It was before, oh. it was before the Arnold, maybe like two years ago. And I sat by him with the ambulance and everything. It was a really, really bad accident. And Hope after he was I okay. finished, 
Yeah, he's okay. <laughs> After I made sure he was okay, got him home. We went to the hospital, got him home, everything. Right. I took myself right onto that gym at twelve o'clock at night, and I know, and I don't walk, I don't work out at nighttime like that. Twelve a.m. I'm in there by myself, finishing my workout because the workout is my workout. Ain't no, nothing, nothing, <laughs> hey, no done, one would deter me from my goals. I did the same thing, man. I remember, I remember being in the gym at one o'clock in the morning because I was like, yeah. no, I'm not gonna skip this crap. This is not gonna. I, I don't, I'm not gonna don't skip my cardio. I don't skip my workouts. And I remember when I was in college and when I was after that, I would, when I dated, I remember I would tell my, girl, my girlfriend, I said, look, I said, look, this is what you signed up for. Yep. I, I am, I don't, I do not make concessions with my <laughs> meal planning and my, and my workouts. I said, look, mm-hmm. it doesn't mean, it does not mean I do not love you. It means that, mm-hmm. I, that I love myself more. Mm-hmm. I was like, I, I have to. <laughs> that's exactly right. And that's what my boyfriend, he competes too, thankfully. So I don't have to explain as much. <laughs> But literally, as I told him, as soon as I go back to Phoenix, I said, listen, two minute phone calls only. I love you. I'll talk to you in three weeks. Okay. And nothing will change. I said, but I can't have my energies. You're not going to enter my positivity bubble. If you are in a bad mood, you keep that keep shit to the, yourself. That's right. Okay. Hey, <laughs> I man, don't want to deal with it. I have <laughs> had this conversation with my significant other about, about uh, I said, look, man, I do not want to engage in mm-hmm. discussions that don't make me feel good. I will. <laughs> It's, the, it's really like you want me to wallow in misery with you? Is that what you want? Because it's not really helpful for anybody. It doesn't help you. It doesn't help me. As a matter of fact, it just makes it worse. Exactly. And, I, and so I totally, that resonates with me completely. Because um, it's, like I said, like that's why I named this show ha- Handle Your High. Because to me, that represents that we each, it's our responsibility to manage our own emotions, our own feelings. Yes. It's like, it's not my job to manage yours. Even if, I, even if you made it, I couldn't. I yeah. can't. I can't. I can't dance a good enough dance to make you feel good all the time. Maybe mm-hmm. sometimes. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that's so, and, and so you, it's a losing battle. It's like going into a war that you know you're going to lose. Exactly. So, uh, but most people play that game and they wonder why they get divorced. They wonder why <laughs> they're upset. They wonder why they hate each other. After. It's like, but you guys, but you loved each other in the beginning. It's because mm-hmm. you weren't focused on the stuff you didn't like. Exactly. You let that dominate your experience after a while. And that's the, and I, you know, so it's kind of funny that you say that because I'm so, I rarely meet people that actually get this, truly get this. <laughs> it's like, it makes life so much easier, so much mm-hmm. simpler, and everybody's happier. Yes. Everybody's happier. I'm very straightforward. Like, listen, hey, nope. As I told you, I literally had this conversation the other day. I said, baby, I understand that you had a bad day. Okay. I need a smile. Give me a <laughs> smile when you walk in the door. I don't want to see nothing but teeth. <laughs> but in the next three weeks, I don't care. Fake it till you make it. But what you want to know is if you're having a bad day, we don't need to speak. Just say, I'm not having a good day. Great. Okay. I'll talk to you in three weeks. <laughs> like, that's it. It's that simple. You it is. Or you don't. <laughs> I, think, um, I think a lot of people really want someone to just like, sort of wallow around with them. And I get it. Yeah, no. I get it. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't really work too good. I'm like, no. <laughs> because I'm really a firm believer in momentum in this, in this universe. Yes. That when yes. you give your energy to something, it, act, it builds momentum, man. Like, so why would I want to give it to like something that doesn't, that's bad? That's make that's frustrating. That's that's that makes me angry. That's like you know I keep that stuff out of my life, man. Like yep. I didn't always. There were years back where, um, luckily for me, I was so focused on the stuff I was excited about that that most people who met me, the only they mostly they say, "Oh, you're so positive. You're so much energy." I'm like, because I was only focused. And then they would also follow that up with, "You're so selfish." It's like, <laughs> I'm, like <laughs> I'm like, what aren't we all? Right. Like, are, are we supposed to be? Like, if mm-hmm. I'm not focused on me, are you going to be? Exactly. <laughs> is, is like, and it's not, I would never ask that of anybody. I would mm-hmm. never ask that. No, because it's not their job. You've got a hard mm-hmm. enough job focusing on you. Exactly. But, but when we can come together and we can be happy and we can, we can add value to each other, man, then it's the good stuff, right? Yep, like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, that's a good, you know, I, I'm, I, it, took me, it took me a lot of reading, a lot of introspection, a lot of meditation I'm to come to all this stuff. <laughs> so, so how, how do you how did you come did, did, did you grow up in an atmosphere that encouraged like these this kind of behavior this kind of <laughs> that's a no <laughs> oh, yeah i don't think so i think it's been a lot of trial and error through my younger days i that's know some... i'm still young but my i've been dating for a very long time i think my instances with that have taught me a lot and they have also shaped me into the woman i am today thankfully Yes, me too. Uh, I, but yeah, so all those trial and errors, lots of error, lots and lots and lots of error. But isn't error. isn't isn't that how we ask for more? Isn't that how we yeah. we ask for something better? It's like, yeah, man, yeah. I know because I don't like that. You have to go through the bad to know That's what right. good is. 
So these days I say, whenever I experience something that I don't like, um, in my mind, the first thing I think of, I say, thank you. Yes. Even, even before I know how it's going to be, be positive for me, I say, thank mm-hmm. you. It's, I get in the habit of, of gratitude. Even mm-hmm. if I don't feel like it, I'm like, oh, no, 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 Ted. Just because you don't know, just because you don't know how this is going to be positive for you doesn't mean you can't be thankful. I'm mm-hmm. thankful because mm-hmm. when I went through my divorce a couple years ago, I did not know how that was going to be positive. Okay. At mm-hmm. the, when it first hit, but man, today, it's not that I, and I still, I love her very much, but man, I'm so thankful because man, did it push me to become so, to, to, to become so much more powerful of a positive person, of a loving person, of a joyful person mm-hmm. than I have today. And I'm like, man. If I was still in that situation, if I had forced that situation yeah. to be different, then I would probably be miserable right now, mm-hmm. at least in that aspect of my life. Mm-hmm. Or I'd be like, no, 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 we got to go. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's like, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> so it's funny that you say so. Yeah, I definitely believe that our that the contrast of our life, all those is it adds. So, it, it's what gives us all the good stuff. Like when I was telling talking to one of my clients uh, the, the other day about this, we're talking about becoming better and being a champion. I said, look, every champion knows. Everybody who's really achieved something great out there knows that it's the, their losses and their challenges that, that gave them everything. Like, it's not when you won. When you won, you did it right. You learned nothing. You, you, it is who you are. But most champions want to be better. They want to be something more. Yep. And the only way yep. to become more is to be poked and prodded and yep. told, get the fuck back on the line. <laughs> yep, that's exactly right. It's a hard one to tell because a lot of people just, they don't, it's natural, I think, for people to want to just have it handed to them. Like, like, yeah, yeah, but that's no fun. I, yeah, it's no fun. <laughs> and I think it also ties back to their upbringing. We've, I, everybody in my culture, we've never had anything handed to us. So it's kind of like, you got to work, buddy. Yeah. Like you, you pop out the womb knowing like that's our speech out the gate. You got to be two times better from A, B, C, and D to get anywhere. We, and so that's how I was raised. So I'm always like, all right, gotta go harder. Next thing, what's next? What's we, next? You know, you got you have a double whammy. Not only be black, but also be a woman. Yep. And uh, so you have to be, you do have to be better, and you have to be better in a way that is not offensive. And that's and exactly that's kind right. of that's, and that's hard because men aren't held to that same standard. That's exactly uh, right. But that, as soon as you find the art to it, <laughs> the art to it, it's, and it's a nice balance where. You don't want to compromise yourself, but you got to find that balance where you're able to go through society. You got to be able to navigate society, but you want to make sure you're still yourself at the same time. So when you find that nice balance where you can just kind of just get where you need to go, you're good to go because now I'm there. It took me a long time to get there because it's like, oh, I don't want to do A, B, C, and D, but it's trial and error. Oh, just trial A lot of no's. Yeah, a lot of no's will tell you how to how you need to change what needs to what what the image should be in order to get to where you need to go. And so I always it was one movie, so it's, a, it's not a great movie. I I love the movie. It's called Players Club. I like you know, Players Club. What are you kidding me? You like Players Club. I like Players Club. Don't know what it was. Okay. No, I know that. I would just I would I, if, on my Instagram today. I would just listen to uh, some guy. I don't know if you know like the group. There was an old '90s R&B band. Like guy and like uh, like it just like grew me and and, uh, and and Teddy's Jam. All these songs I really like because uh-huh. I, like, I like Teddy Riley and all these guys. They were I think they were that te- I think Teddy's Jam was in that movie in, okay. in the soundtrack of that movie. <laughs> so anyways, go ahead. Yeah. So the the main quote all is it's literally my favorite movie as a little girl. You clearly you can tell what I was watching. Right. Okay. <laughs> But it was like, make the money, don't let the money make you. So when I heard that, I translated that into play the game, don't let the game play you. So if you're aware that you're automatically in a game out the gate, you navigate. Don't take anything personally. You just navigate. Play the game. And you get what you need from the game. That's how you go. That's what I do. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I like that. That's a good perspective. How, um, did you have a challenging childhood then? Did you, was it challenging or was it pretty comfortable? Being a black woman in the South is, you know, it is what it is. Right. <laughs> uh, especially because the schools I went to, my mom made sure I went to the best schools in Georgia. The best schools in Georgia tend to have predominantly white um, students. So navigating being a person of color in those arenas and, and dealing with students who aren't used to um, black people who want to excel, that was a challenge in itself. So you had to fight the system in all teams of the world of word. <laughs> Um, for instance, like even in, um, elementary school, I just lost a tooth or something. So I couldn't say like my S's and my R's. And so they you're tried the... to put me in special ed classes. What? Cause you had yes. a little, cause you lost your tooth. <laughs> oh, 
And so, but could you imagine if my parents weren't there? My mom was like, what? what? <laughs> and so, but it took that time for, so, it took my parents being able to be there to say, hey, this one of four black people in your school is not going to be put in special ed because she can't say a word the way you think it should be said. They were projecting, see, perception is projection. You know, it's like they're just projecting what they perceive. And they Funniest thing later, a couple months later, they were testing me for challenge. I said, so how did that work? That so I was just special, and now but you're... now I could be in the challenge classes. <laughs> but it's funny how it worked. But literally instances like that, the little microaggressions happen every single day. You just learn to navigate. Oh, wow. Well, you know, like when I, my, my brother and I, we, we, went to, we went to Montessori school. And uh, when we were like five or something, and it was like sort of a preschool kind of thing. And I remember they tested everybody. And so my brother and I, because we're identical twins, we didn't want to interact with anybody else. I wasn't used to that. We weren't used to, we were just used to interacting with each other. And we were very comfortable with each other. And um, we slept in the same room, we all that kind of stuff. And uh, they, they didn't like this, so they wanted mm. to separate us. So when we, they separated us, at four years old, we just didn't interact. And so, because right. um, we were scared. I remember that mm-hmm. school. We would cry when she left, for, left us there, and we would cry until she got back. And mm-hmm. they, they told my mother after they tested us, I shit you not. They said, your sons will be good at nothing. They said, <laughs> now my brother is, my brother is, is a professor at University of Washington. He just got a dean position at Arizona State. He's, a, he's, he's actually got a couple book of the year awards in rhetoric and composition. I mean, he's really top of the field. I've done very well in my life. I, I went to graduate school. I, don't, I was like, look. So they were obviously wrong. And actually, by the way, I did have my IQ tested because they said we were, they said that we didn't have, our intellectually, we weren't, we weren't there. I've had my IQ test and, and I test out at 157. Um, so it's like, but the point is that they didn't want they because we weren't fitting into their box. Yes. They they said no. You guys, you know, we're the, you know we need to have some special classes or whatever they wanted. And I did. They actually when I was in, I think it was I was in elementary school or something. I, I did go to uh, a reading is fundamental courses because I was slow okay. reading because I couldn't see. We then, my mm-hmm. mother did, they didn't identify that I needed glasses. Mm-hmm. And I had uh, tubes in my ears before. This. I didn't have them yet. But I had fluid built in my ears, so I couldn't hear that well. And so uh, I was mispronouncing words. Kind of funny you say that because I was doing the same thing and I couldn't see. So naturally, I thought, I'm not kidding you, I thought the teachers just gave good grades to people that they liked. Yeah. <laughs> because I was like, man, I'm, I'm trying like everybody else. And I was getting like C's and D's and it was a struggle. Mm-hmm. And, and then uh, one of my teachers, luckily enough, one of my teachers noticed that she's like, can you see the board, Tad? Because <laughs> like, like, I'm in the back going like this. And, she, mm-hmm. and I would sit in the back because I was embarrassed, you know. And, and uh, so she got my mother to get me tested. And then we got glasses and stuff. Mm-hmm. Kind of funny because my best teacher, and I, do, I don't even remember her name, but mm-hmm. she was a big, rotund black lady. And mm-hmm. she was my math teacher in sixth grade. Yeah. That she was my first A I ever got because she got, I got in that class. And she said, all right, Dad, I know you can do better than this. She's like, you're going to come after school Every day, I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to do your homework together. And, and after I got, I, and so I did that every day. And she was, and everybody was scared to take her class because I went to, in Las Vegas, I went to a sixth grade center. So all the, in the black, in the North Las Vegas where I live, which is a predominantly black area. Um, then I moved to East Las Vegas. Before that, I was in North Las Vegas. And we, and, uh, no, excuse me, I went to, uh, to uh, West Las Vegas. So we went, uh, it was kind of a trailer park. It was a trailer park. So it was kind of a, a poor area, but we were bused into a sixth grade center because mm-hmm. the poor areas were um, complaining that their kids had to be bused into the white areas. Mm. So they made sixth grade centers for when you got to sixth grade, you went to the sixth grade center. So we were, everybody was bused in. So, in these, so she was from there. And so she was kind of a rough around the edges, kind of a woman. But, mm-hmm. I, but she, so everyone was scared to take her class. They said, oh, she's yeah. really tough and she's really hard on you. And I'm like, oh man, I got this, I got her. And so, and then she <laughs> kept me after class, but I got my first A in her class. And, and I'll tell you, all that, all she did was she gave me the confidence. I said, I can get an, if I can get, and I, this, I remember consciously telling this to myself, if I can get an A in her class, I can get an A in any class. And after that, I consistently got A's or B until I got in high school, I got A's. And then in college, I got A's. And then in graduate school, I got nothing but A's. So it was like, and, and it was really fun. That was a turning point in my classroom career. Mm-hmm. And it was all based on one person, just like your coach, yep. one person who had faith in me and believed in me. And, I, and I, I feel bad because I don't even remember her name. I wish I could because I would love to write a letter or go something and, and, and give it to her and tell her thank you. 
mm-hmm. because she had such a deep impact on my life. And she all she did was teach me math. <laughs> yep, that's funny. It's my same math teacher, my third grade math teacher, Ms. Bishop Harkness. Remember, they were <laughs> Facebook friends. That's all I know. But she she was a stickler. She was she did not play games. Like she would run us a speed test, everything. But she made sure, and then she was friends with um my friend that she was Mexican, Jeannie. So she that's when I can tell that she she cared about people of color. So she made sure that we were learning at the same pace as everybody else. Like she was on us, like like right, like she was on us. But it's funny that I think back now and I'm like, God, she really had my back. But from that day on, I was on it. Like I was on it. She, <laughs> she like you said, you take that one person to give that confidence. Hopefully it happens earlier the better. Like my parents, of course, they were my base, but in the in the in the moment, you kind of need somebody who's in that arena to give you that base too. Like your your parents are your parents, right? Like right. they're gonna support you. You kind of need somebody like to be like, okay, yeah, you're you're doing this well, right. Yeah, because you get to a certain age and you think, well, my mom, they're gonna they're supposed to love me. It's like they, you know, it's like my mom only thinks good things about me. But when somebody else does too, it's like it's kind of a confirmation. Yeah, you're like it's like, hey man, oh yeah, well she thinks I'm special. Like I think I must be able to do this. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's so important. That's why I try to be encouraging to everybody. And people say, oh, can you think I can do that? And I said, absolutely, you can do it. But you got to mm-hmm. believe it first. You have yep. to believe it. You have to believe it. It's, that's an energy that you. It's not by proof. Now, mm-hmm. I asked two questions. I've said this many times. I asked two questions of everybody that I work with, um, the athletes, that is. I say, do you, are mm-hmm. you positive and do you believe in yourself? And the answer is almost always yes and yes. But the, the real answer is almost always no and no. Right. <clears throat> and I don't, I don't it's, you can't get this, these answers wrong, but um, they intend, the real answers are that they, people intend to be positive. Um, and that's good. That's good. They just need to learn modalities in their life to be able to, mm-hmm. to, to do that and learn how to be aware, like you said, be aware when these things are, are happening. Mm-hmm. But most people believe in themselves only as far as life presents them with positive things. Until life presents them a challenge where they don't quite meet up to their expectations, then they're like, oh, I must not be able to do it. Or, oh, that's too hard. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. If everybody said that, we would never have any innovation. We would never have anything. It's like, it's like, I think it's this. Um, I remember I read this really cool uh, biography of Michael Jordan. And uh, something about he was talking about some uh, newscaster asked him, hey, you know, how come you've got such high, consistent, great game point averages? How do you do this all the time? And he says, well, you only remember the ones I make. <laughs> it's like, I throw the ball at the hoop more than anybody else, and that's why I do it. And that's why I'm there. And so, but the, for me, the takeaway was he's failed more times than he succeeds. Yep. And so it's like, but we only remember his successes. And that goes true mm-hmm. for everybody, everybody, everybody. You know, it's like, so, and I think um, it's our failures that really define our character. How, yes, I should absolutely. say how we respond to it. How we respond. Absolutely. How do you, how have you combated it? Because, I mean, granted, you've been pretty successful in your competitive career, but I'm sure there are points that you felt, felt really deeply challenged. What was that and how did you sort of negotiate that? I think I view challenges a little bit differently. I think because I was so challenged <laughs> early on in life that nothing that has happened recently, I don't I don't look at it as a challenge. I look at it as a test. Um, so, like, it was one quote I saw. It was, like, um, either cha- – I don't know if you use the word challenge, but it was, like, things happen in order to test you to see if you're the person you claim to be. So when you get te- you're tested, I think it's a lot of a lot of different tests. So if I lose or if I don't um, have a certain look that I want a certain time, it's all in the test of how you're going to handle that. And so that's why I get my practice daily of how I'm handling situations. So like even when I um, I also move on very quickly, I don't dwell on things. Good for you. Um, so like even when I got um, I think the, the, the second time I got second last year. I stayed into myself. I said, so what did I not do? That's step number one. I ain't got nothing to do with anybody else. What did I not do? Because it's not my coach. My coach is my coach. He's he's on his point. What what did I not do? That's one. Two, okay, what's the next show? Three, what's the blame plan for the next show? Okay, good. So you have the, you take the loss or whatever the test was, notice it. All right, next. And move on to the next thing. But I do that same thing with wins as well. So, like, as soon as I won the Olympia, I was like, all right, so what's my meal plan for next week? 
Arnold. Let's get ready for the Arnold. <laughs> so like, but you got to move on, and whether it's a win or a loss, because that that I think that in itself tells you what kind of athlete you want to be. And if you're complacent, I don't believe in complacency. I don't believe in arrogance. I don't believe in anything. Anybody thinking that you're entitled to get A, B, C, or D. Like, no, you need to work, and you need to continue to work. And so that's the that type of athlete I always plan to be, and I always will be. So. Nothing's ever going to be handed to me. I know the same way I wanted that first Olympia win and the second one and however else I plan to complete. I need to be working every single day, not every here and there, every single day for that next goal. Once I accomplish that next goal, I drop that one. All right, that was great. Move on to the next thing. But that's the only way I feel like you can just keep building and not getting complacent. If you feel like you always have somewhere to go, then you're your goal. But yeah. if you think you're good to go, you're just going <laughs> to sit there looking the same <laughs> and being bored. It, it's kind of the philosophy that they that sort of is, is said out there about winning. They say that yeah. it can, constant winning can create complacency, um, uh, but only for certain athletes, only for certain people and certain athletes, because mm -hmm. this kind of mindset that you're talking about does not breed complacency because you're mm -hmm. asking you're asking these vital questions instead of just saying, good job, good job, Sid, good job, I'm doing good, let's keep doing it. That's okay too. That's okay, but it doesn't really encourage you to say, like you said, what did I not do? What do I need? What do we need to do next? And like you know, and I think that's important. But my real question is, why do you do all that you do? Why why do you push yourself so hard? Because for me, all of my competitive career and all my career goals started out not they're not that way today, but they started out because I had very low self esteem. I needed to validate myself. I needed to be. I thought that I needed to do this so I could prove to myself, prove to the world how good I was. I knew I was good on the inside, but man, I needed to prove it. And now I know I don't need to prove shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, I, I am what I am, I am, I am good. Mm -hmm. And so all I need now is just to enjoy my ride. But what about, mm -hmm. what pushes you? Why do you do what you do? I'm a perfectionist. <laughs> and I also am a very strong type A personality. So if I feel like, Anything can be better. Oh, I'm going for it. Like, and I know, and it's, the thing is, I know that age will help me be better. So I just got to keep competing. <laughs> that's just how, how I look at it. So whether that that's age in itself, no matter if I keep the exact same training style, my body will shift because of that simple reason. So that's the way I look at it. And I'm, I'm going to keep on waiting to see what the next look will be. And I'm going to just keep on working and doing the same things and making these muscle fibers as dense as they can be to create another look and just each and every year. Oh, how does she do it? Because I'm working and I'm never going to stop. My foot is on the gas until I retire. That's it. <laughs> like I'm not, I'm not, there is no chill you, mode, no relaxing, none of that. You, I'm pushing. Do, when you look at your career in, in, the, in the fitness field and figure, do you see a timeline or do you just say? I always have a timeline. Oh, really? So like what's your, so, t so give, t maybe give, a, give me a hint of what your timeline is. I want, oh, this would be the main hint. I want to have kids by 34. Okay. And how old are you now? I'm 26. Okay. That's awesome. That's good. You got a, that's a nice time. That's good. Mm -hmm. That's right before AMA, advanced maternal age. <laughs> <laughs> 36 is advanced maternal age. So it's like 30. Mm -hmm. You're like, you don't want to be in that demographic. Where you That's exactly right. That's exactly <laughs> how did I know, how right did I know that you even thought of that? Like, <laughs> I had a plan. Originally, the plan was to have kids by 27. And I was like, I started laughing. By the time I hit 24, I said, oh, that's not going to happen. <laughs> no, ma'am. Not happening. <laughs> and so I changed it. Mm -hmm. but, but, but beyond that, like uh, you, so you want to compete? Throughout the whole, I'm competing all the way through Good there. Um, I may take. I wouldn't say I were tired, but I may take a break because I definitely want to see, have my kids see me on stage. Oh, okay. So whether I come back later on down the line, that's a possibility. Um, and also give me something to do. I want to be like, I want to be that 50 year old on stage, like, hey, I still got it. You know, <laughs> that's what I want to do. I love it. I love it. <laughs> you sound, you know, when I as I talk to you about this, it really sounds like you're having a lot of fun with your. Yeah. With your that's good, man. That to me, that's the secret ingredient. I mean, I think you need a, a you need a positive outlook in life in general to make it through mm -hmm. life. I don't not just for athletes, but just to make it through life without feeling like you got beat the fuck up. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> but also, it's like if you got you can't enjoy your presence now, man. That was something that I wish I would have heard in my twenties because uh, I was so focused on moving forward and I was I was having some fun, but I was so focused that I oftentimes was you know you. 
I tell people this that look anxiety and depression uh, are the things that we are most plagued with when you look go to doctors they, they'll tell you 60 65 percent of the cases are it's all about anxiety and depression and that is about not being in your now it's about not knowing who you are and not being in your now because anxiety is usually a focus on the on the future uh, assuming mm. some negative outcome and mm. a depression or sadness is usually a focus on the past and some regrets or some bad events that you're dwelling on and this is mm. all forward and backwards is not your now and so mm -hmm. you can't when you're not in your now you can't create mm -hmm. uh, you know you can't create anything new mm -hmm. you either recreate the past or re or start creating what you're fearing in the future right so like so for me like this is what it, this is how i kind of keep myself i wish i would have had that sensibility because man it would have made i did so well but it would i think i would have done so much better what gave you that person what what really was it the yoga was it like because you seem to have a really wonderful mm -hmm. um mature enlightened uh sense of evolved sensibility I think yoga started my path down um, mental awareness. Okay. Uh, I think so that, then that from yoga, that led to meditation, that led to my, my mindfulness, that led to just just how I view everything. But I think it all started with, like I've already done physical stuff, but I think mentally the shift started happening once I was doing yoga. Okay. And I started doing more research and finding out different methods and talking to other yogis and different teachers. I even had a mindfulness teacher. We had tapes awesome. and everything. Like it was a key thing, especially because I took it in our med school at Penn oh. because they, it's, it was a, it's a, a course that a lot of the doctors take. So we were, it was, I was in a course with a lot of doctors because they need it because their, their suicide rates are so high. So it, I was in there with them. We were learning how, how to go about it, how it affects their patients, how it affects them as physicians and everything like that. So I was just taking a class. They, they let me right into it. And they were like, all right, yeah, you could definitely take it. And so I was in the med school taking that class too. But that solidified everything because that's when I learned the different types of meditation and how they affect their body. Oh, but wow. before I would do like different mindfulness um, um, routines. But that, that one class, my senior year in undergrad, that taught me the most about meditation and mindfulness. Wow, that's pretty cool. I didn't even know they even had those courses in there. I didn't either. And I, I was just looking, I said, I need one more credit. I was like, please. <laughs> Isn't it funny how like those one things you add in are like sometimes the most profound? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I took, I did I did that in college, I took an art appreciation class. I was like, oh, yeah. I'm like easy fucking A, I'm like, just a bullshit credit. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, this is an awesome class. I'm like, this mm -hmm. is totally awesome. I love this. It gave me an appreciation for art. Like, you know? mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, so you never really know like and that uh, archery I, I don't I don't do archery now but t uh, I took this archery class and it turns out that I was a, the, my, my the instructor's like you're a natural dad and I'm like <laughs> oh thanks I don't he was, I said what makes a person you know good at this he said being able to perform the exact same actions time time and time again oh I could do that let me just go ahead and do that that sounds like fun <laughs> I mean when you pull it when you pull it back you got to pull it back exactly the spot exact same uh -huh. way your breathing has to be the same everything has uh -huh. to be the same I'm like uh -huh. and I'm being so consciously aware of my body at the time I was a bodybuilder I'm like I was like I just it just came naturally I think something mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was just because Believe it or not, it is not an easy thing to hit those targets from like, no. it's like, and when you lose an arrow, it, it goes right into the grass. It, 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 it's gone. You can't find it. <laughs> <laughs> you spend half an hour looking for your, all your arrows and shit. <laughs> so I did not want to miss. Right. <laughs> like, nope. Does the, um, so do you still, you, do you still taking those kind of classes or you just read books now? Or is that what I do books, um, but I learned so much that I'm pretty much grounded in the knowledge that I have. And so I'll just do different, um, different styles and finding my own spin on mixing everything that I've learned and what, what fits best in my life. But that's why I learned the food um, version because nobody ever taught me that. One. W w explain and, that. Um, where like I meditate while I eat. Oh, no one ever taught me that one. Yeah, I've never even heard of this until you mentioned mm -hmm. it. Like, that's really cool. What? And so I developed that technique for myself because I know that's something that I'm going to always do. It's something that I appreciate. It's already something I love. So I mix all the things that I like and need into one instance. How does now, was it, has been, what, is it difficult? How, how do I word this? Has it been difficult for your uh, your your boyfriend or your significant others and uh, to, to 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 negotiate because it's not a normal because i had like it's not no it's, right, not, no. it's not it's not it's not a practice like even my girlfriend who's who's half thai half chinese and is very asian by nature even though mm -hmm. she grew up predominantly in the chicago area and she's a doctor she's a, she's a, mm -hmm. she's a very good doctor uh, but she 
doesn't like she doesn't meditate she doesn't, which I'm like your dad's like all of the meditation and, you, and he lives in Bangkok and, like, and, but you do nothing like but she can she's very good at it but she's but it's, it's a lot of things I do it's not doesn't resonate with her and there's very mm-hmm. Easter which is really kind of funny but mm-hmm. so, but that's a conflict sometimes so how does that how, how he do you, just laughs he thought I was a joke <laughs> in the beginning he he, he laughs he's like alright because he'll know and all my friends know it, especially when it's a cheat meal do not, not talk me an hour before my meal until I'm done. That is it. Leave me be. Let me enjoy this in my now because I'm very present when I eat. That's the one time if there's anything Why? else going on. Is it because I, I just love food. I'm obsessed with oh, it. Oh, really? Oh, well, you're food. I'm even reading a book about food right now. Like, it, it, I'm just, I just love food. I oh. always have. I'm obsessed with it. <laughs> Like, if you look at my baby videos, I'm I'm always with the ball. Like, somebody tries to talk to me, I literally snatch the ball and start eating. Like, it, and I've noticed, I said, God, I've been this way my whole life. But, yeah, so he'll oh, laugh okay. now, and he knows. He'll tell people, if anybody, hey, you better stop talking to her. I, <laughs> I would ignore people. I would sit there and ignore people. Like, unless the only time I'll talk is on those two days where I'm eating all day long, and I can eat 24-7 literally every minute of those days. Then it's fine. It's not that much of an experience. But if I have that one meal, and I, or I'm that I'm in prep and I'm enjoying my meal, leave me alone. That's yeah. it. I don't ask for a lot. It's just gonna take me about ten minutes. This okay? is my this is my personal time. <laughs> this is my time exactly. Especially <laughs> at work, I'm like, oh my god, this is my time. Where, where now? Where do, you, to me. do you? Where do you work now? Where do you? Um, well, I work for myself now. But okay. back when I was I was working at our international student center okay. when I was at USC. And so we would always, I always, every time I eat, this other guy who was working at uh, what the USC bank or something like that, he would come in the room and want to have this drawn out conversation. And you're I'm like, like, dude, oh, you're, oh, you're oh like, my God, please. You're like, you're like, dude, when I, when there's a meal in front of me, it's like church. Exactly. <laughs> but then the funny thing is they'll, they'll not pick up once again, they don't read body language because I'm still not going to talk to you. You can talk at me because you're talking at me. You're not going to get a response. Right. And I'm just going to look at you and continue eating my food. And so now you're going to feel awkward, okay, because I'm going to eat my food. <laughs> and you're just going to annoy me. That's all I know. <laughs> so that's it. So now how are you going to, how are you going to, how are you going to, how are you going to train? Are you going to, how are you going to negotiate your career in the, in, in the public relations and this, with the uh, competing? Are you going to be able to do that? Cause that's hard for a lot of people. It's hard. I can, um, freelancing for a while. I want to really focus on my competitions while having the ability to work on the outside of that for like the next five years. Then after that, that's when I'll, I'll think about going into corporate America. Everybody's telling me I probably won't want to do that, but yeah. But you never know. You never know. You, I, right. think it, I think it's smart just to let things flow the way they're going to flow. That's the, that's you don't I have to have all the answers. Exactly. That's what I've learned. And that's, that's what got me back into school because originally I was like, oh, no, I, if I don't go back straight to school after undergrad, I'm not going to go back. I that's back. not true. That's not exactly. True. I, I, <laughs> may, I may go back. I, was about, I may go back and get my PhD in peace studies or, or, more, oh, yeah. or more specifically in behavioral sciences because – I really do behavioral sciences. I just have that love for this man. Like when I, I remember being in graduate in, in college in undergrad, and I just man, I took all these psychology courses because it was like you know that those I needed just something, but I it was like an option. But I just took them because they sounded interesting, and I smoked them. Man, they were so easy. I never studied, and the guys like you, you need to do, you need to do some graduate work in this. I said, I said, well, I got this other stuff. You know, I'm I'm, I'm mm-hmm. studying nutrition. I'm studying this other, but mm-hmm. I didn't want to get a degree in that. I actually ended up getting degrees in philosophy. Okay. And ethics and stuff because I was interested in that. Mm -hmm. Uh, But when I look at it now, I was really interested in it because of of behavior. I'm really sort of interested. I'm like, human behavior, this is what I'm interested in because I want to manipulate my own behavior. I want to understand my own behavior and Mm -hmm. I work with it. And so, you know, as you know, like when you work with somebody, um, you're really, you're trying to get them to change behaviors and they they fight themselves. Yep. And they don't want to. You know, I was a psychology major. Oh, you were? I was a psychology major oh, okay. in undergrad. Yep. Oh, I originally was going to be um, do cognitive science, but then oh, man. they tossed computer programming at me, and I was oh, like, man. wait a minute. You're like, <laughs> hard pass on that. I didn't sign up for that. And I told my advisor, he was like, yes, and I thought I'd mention that you you might want to have a love for computer programming and linguistics. Why? I said, how, does that, how are they tying it together? That was a part of our program. So, so oh. like, psych at Penn was a whole nother level. We were learning the same classes as everybody who was pre-med. We had neuroscience. We had all of all of our requirements. I literally was about to pull my hair out. Stress, <laughs> stress. I was stressed. I was like, and I told my mom, I said, Lord, let me just make it through. Let me make it. When I got that piece of paper, I said, Praise, <laughs> stress. 
I said, everybody's like, how's the master's program? I was like, 10 times easier than undergrad. Undergrad tried to kill me. It really did, <laughs> quite honestly. Like that with track and two jobs and competing, I was like, listen, um, I need a break. And that's why I took a three-year break. And then I went back. I was like, I need a break because that was too much. That was, when I look back, I was like, that was really too much. And did you, when you won your Olympia the first time, mm-hmm. um, did, did anybody at school did they know all? Did they were they involved? Did they, did they know this? Did you did you encounter any interesting stories about like people? Would, oh yeah, I saw you in the magazines, or I saw you on this, or, <laughs> or you or you won this, or I know. That, I'm just curious, you know. Funniest thing <laughs> is when I come back. Um, I come back to classes. My Monday class is my writing class. Uh, I come back and literally they're all in the hallway. Hey, we saw you on Snapchat. <laughs> so freaking cool. You were I'm literally like, because like, I don't have a Snapchat. So I was like, what? Are you I was like, what? Yeah. I'm, I'm literally such the opposite of a millennial. I'm literally just like, Good for you. what social media? I have my Facebook that I check sometimes, Instagram that I'm forced to check, and that's it. And other than that, I literally get on that for an hour. I set my timer to an hour a day. That's it. And wow. I'm off two days a week. Thursdays, mm-hmm. no Instagram. Haven't looked at a feed and I don't know long. Sundays, Definitely no Instagram, social media, nothing. Leave me alone. <laughs> I know my, my girlfriend and I, and I have to live on it a little bit because I work this stuff and this is my business. I know. But I, uh, but I give myself, like, usually, and just so people know, like, Sundays, I usually don't do much at all. And on Saturdays, I just do a couple things, but I don't, I, but I, but even when I'm working, I am not a scroller. Yes, that's the key. Don't I do, scroll. I just get don't do work it. And get off. I'm like, I do my work, and then I respond to the messages, and yes. I interact with that, but then I'm just, I don't scroll, man. And, and my, girl, my girlfriend's always like, you didn't like my pictures? I'm like, I don't see your pictures. I said, I said, I said like, that's I'm like, I don't get on social media to look at stuff, look at stuff like that. That's not why I do it. You know, like I, it's marketing for me. Yes, <laughs> and that that's my new thing is I'll get on for like my sponsors and everything like that. I'll I'll do my job, right? And then I get off. I respond to my responses. Get off. That's it. No, I don't sit there. If it takes longer than five minutes, that's enough. Hey man, I I start to like get worried, man. I'm like, oh, if you're scrolling, Ted, I'm like, fuck, what the fuck is this on? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, it's a time suck. It just it sucks. Is. It's like, it's a, it's gone. It's gone. Like, and well, you I, can spend that relaxing instead of looking at what the next person is doing. I can spend that reading my, like, I can spend that reading some more of my book, man. Uh, exactly. Like, like, <laughs> but that's, that's my new thing is my, cause I always get off the week before a show. And so I was like, huh, let's just, every single, every, every prep, I'm like, what can I do differently this year? So this year I was like, all right, let's do two days of no social media for every single week going into how, the show. How did you come up with that? Was that just something you came just up with? Just randomly. Oh, it's a smart technique. It's a well, smart technique. Well, thank you. Because yeah, I was technique. reading because I was like, what, what, am, what am I looking at? Yeah, like, how is this adding value to my life? It's, not, it's doing nothing for me. Because I only get on social media to either, it needs to be looking at food or somebody's <laughs> telling me a joke. I don't care what your six pack looks like. I don't care what your workout looks like. If it's not a joke or food, I don't care. I don't care. That's not what I want to see. That's not what I'm here for. So once I start seeing a whole bunch of bodies, I'm like, all right, I got to go. <laughs> Okay, well, it's good. the same stuff all the time, seems like to me. Yeah. Like, and I get it. It's, you know, like I look on, I, I'll go and I'll look at particular people's profiles because I want to see what their progress pictures are like because I might be reporting on them or I might be. Right. right. So that I, makes I, sense. Yeah. Well, I, or if I'm going to interview them, I go, go look at their thing and see, oh, what's going on. Um, although I, I must admit, I did not look at yours before I, because I wanted it to be a very warm. Nothing's on there. You're fine. I just wanted it to be an organic <laughs> conversation. <laughs> But uh, but which is why I didn't know you were doing the Arnold. I didn't. I, I actually assumed that you did. You weren't going to do it just simply because you, a lot of people did. Yeah, and uh, so I just assumed you didn't because a lot of the champions from the Olympia don't usually do the Arnold. It's, it's it would be like you compete all year. I never want it. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. But in my mind, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, no, because the thing is, too, and y'all, you know, you know me by now. Listen, if there's a record. I'm coming for it. Right, 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 right. <laughs> that's, the, that's forever my goal. Whatever the record is, I got to beat it before I retire. That's good. That's good. I think that's good. What's, what is, so other than like bodybuilding, fitness, stuff like that, what, do, what, are, what are kind of cool goals do you have that you're excited about? I really, I'm excited to go ahead and start, I, I did open up my, uh, my public relations company, so it's my own company. What's it called? So that way I freelance under that. It's Sydney Gillen and Associates. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. So that way I can hire freelancers to freelance under me freelancing. And that's why I don't do it. 
half of the work. So I just pay them from the person's budget. Um, but so that's my that's what I'm really excited about was really getting dabbling to that. But I've also the main thing now because PR is all about relationships. So since I just moved back to Georgia now, my whole focus has to be on meeting every public relations practitioner in Atlanta. Because that's how you're going to get those jobs. That's how you're going to be on CNN. Granted, my teacher, she was going to, oh, I need to call her. Because <laughs> <laughs> she, she really wants me to be on TV. She's like, Cindy, please. I'm, I'm really excited about this. My friend works at CNN and da, da 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 I'm like, listen, that sounds great. I'm here for it. I would love to be on CNN every day and just show up like, awesome. hey, I'm going to be a consultant. Um, yeah, well, so what does that mean? What, like when, when, when public relations people are consultants for like things like CNN, so like, what, what would you do? Like what, what kind of things would be done? I'm, I'm, um, I don't know much about it. it. It could be a lot of different things. She just wants me to be on the camera oh, okay. in, in some way, form or fashion, because a lot of the times, um, you know, it's who you know. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't even have to know what you're talking about. As long as you know what's supposed to be said, you can be end up being an anchor. You don't necessarily have to go to school to be an anchor. But if you're in the school of communications, communication is communication. So you just navigate your way. I go where my teachers tell me to go because they have all the connections. So I just wide the way. You're playing the game, not letting the game play you. That's exactly <laughs> right. Because the thing is, I can learn any and everything. So if there's a position that needs to be filled, I'll learn it. Yeah, and yeah, I'll yeah. perfect it because I'm, I'm a perfectionist. So whatever needs to be perfected, I'll do it. I think that maybe it would get my guess would be, and you tell me what you think, but I think uh, your career in the fit, bodybuilding fitness industry would, mm. should be able to fuel and help accelerate some of the things you might want to do because it does give you a, a very large audience. Who knows yeah. who knows who you are and who's seen your accomplishments, but also you're in the you're sort of in the spotlight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how do you feel about that that kind of stuff? Um, it it took a while to get used to because I was very I well I still am I'm very low key I don't like to be flashy I'm not I don't I don't even work out in sports bras or shorts you would not see me uncovered unless it's literally right after a show or on stage. Other than that Why? I'm in a sweatshirt like I just don't. Mm, that's not my thing. I, okay. It's just, first of all, I'm a germaphobe too. So it's just like, oh. your your skin is out here touching everybody else's skin. That's just nasty. Like, I just don't <laughs> want to do that. Um, but it's just, I've just always been in the habit of just being covered when I'm outdoors. Like, if I'm in my house, okay, it's in, it's my house. But when I go outdoors, like, even at track, like you, I never wore shorts until at the meet. Oh, really? Okay. That's it. Never in practice, anything like that. I just... I just don't. I don't know. One of the things that I like, and I'm, I'm going to mention it because what I what I appreciate about your presence, uh, it, like I, when I've seen you on social media or I've seen you in pictures, something like that, when you're not on stage, because when, you, when you're um, on stage and you're at a show, you're done up, you have makeup, you look great, and that's beautiful. But then you don't wear makeup and stuff in some of your pictures, and I think that's awesome. I'm like, I really do. I tell It tells me a lot about how comfortable you are in your own skin. Thank you. And yeah, like, I don't wear makeup at all because I can't do it. I just, it's a lot of work. It's a it's ton like, of work. How do y'all sit here all day? I can't. Oh my god! I also just don't care. <laughs> well, and that, well, yeah, that's good. Like, because I think, because um, like, I'll walk out of the house. Like, I used to care more than I do now. Like, but oh, I, this is what I wear to the gym. Okay, I mm -hmm. like, like, I sweat here. I got these baggy sweats. I'm not. I like looking nice sometimes, but if you don't like me the way I am, I'm sorry. Don't look. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And that's what I love. But like, even my sponsorships is. Everybody who aligns with me knows exactly who I am because what I post is me. I'm not about to give you any pretenses. I when, you, when I when I post and I have my headscarf on, that's what you're getting. Okay, <laughs> I'm going. I work out in my headscarf. I'm not gonna take my headscarf off because I'm shooting a video. Have you gotten criticized no. for that? Have you gotten criticized? Nope. No. Never. Okay. Good. Good because I, because I think when I, I was reading this thing about social media about and that's really especially on millennials, it's very specifically millennials. Um, mm -hmm. The on the women, it's very hard on them. It's not mm -hmm. so hard on the men. It seems like they said that um, what it produces in the young girls as they get into adulthood is depression and anxiety, yep. specifically depression. They're big, like more, like more cutters, more self mutilation stuff. Like it's because of this, they, they, it's all the self comparison. They're scrolling, mm -hmm. comparing themselves to all these other ladies, and of course, you, as we both just identified, that isn't even really them. So, mm -hmm. You know, like you just, you know, so, and even if it were, it don't matter. It's not you. It don't matter. Exactly. It's like, <laughs> but, but it, what it's producing. So it certainly didn't produce that in you uh, because, but you also don't approach social media the way that most other. And I didn't grow up with it. That's right. the key thing too. And I praise 
it. I didn't get an Instagram until I got my pro card. Oh, really? I was super behind the ball. I was like, they were, I was like, what is the Instagram? Why am I posting pictures? Like, well, it, I, I was like, I'm like 80 at heart. I'm like, why? <laughs> I know these days I, I do make a point when I talk to some of my athletes, especially the one, the, my pros and stuff. I say, look, you kind of have to be present on social media. Um, you don't have to live on it, but you have to be present. You have to because you you're gonna be you can't, you can't be uh, unknown going in to a show mm-hmm. and the big shows. It's, it doesn't work like that anymore. Like mm-hmm. you, know, you you used to be able to, but now you really can't. There's too much momentum that's generated through social media, um, mm-hmm. often oftentimes. But you don't. But but I think it's a you need a. But I think we need a healthy balance. Um, yes, definitely and, healthy balance. Yeah, but it, it's that's hard. Balance is not something that I think that that champions really get because they, and you can't. To be a champion, you can't be balanced. You gotta put, you gotta, like you said, you gotta put your foot on the throttle, man. Mm-hmm. And, and you gotta say, look, this is what I'm focused on. Mm-hmm. So, like, so, do you find that that's difficult for you to manage? Because, no, because I'm really good at my time management. So when it okay. comes to, um, and I think the the new the new setting on my phone really helps with that too. Because they tell you time screen time now. Yes. I, I was like, so oh, they tell you the screen time, and it'll be like, because I set it for an hour. It will not let me be on social media of any sort after an hour. So whatever needs to be done, that means you have no time to scroll you're, because the time you do all this. the messages, exactly. <laughs> you do your post, you, 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 well, you proofread everything ahead of time, post your post, reply to everybody, and you're off. Your hour is gone at that point. And then you're on to your regular life. It's a, but I think go ahead, that's the key thing that I've learned is just really managing your time. Like I'll pencil out time just to respond to people. And I find that that I had to get used to that because I always respond to people. But when it becomes a whole bunch of people then you really have to manage your time um and so i've gotten really good with that because that's been the most rewarding part i will say because i've met i've met so many amazing people through instagram oh i know like who just have like real questions like they 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 well i think it's because it's also who your followers are that's a a really distinct thing because you don't see booty pics (laughs) Boo pics, <laughs> whole bunch of nudes, anything like that on my profile. So my, that my audience is there for me mm-hmm. and knowledge. That's it. So when they when they speak to me, that's all I get. I don't get all the extra stuff I see on other people's pages. I'm looking like, oh, that sounds miserable. I couldn't deal with that. No, but no. so w- when they come to you with a question, they literally are asking you for help, which I don't mind doing that. I can do that all day. So that's the part that I enjoy. I met so many nice people who legitimately just want help. And like, so I'm like, or help or a listening ear. I can do that. That's fun. That's fun for me. But I had to find the happy place in social media because I'm not a social media person. So I had to like, how is this going to make me happy? So now I'm curious. So like when it comes to social media, how does, what do they talk about when you, when, when you're in graduate school, when it comes to PR, did they, did they have that as, I mean, how did they marry this? Right? Like it's got to be a part of it. Right. Cause it's such a, a powerful part of our, huge piece. yeah, it's such it's, a big part of marketing. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a huge piece. And a lot of my program I use basically geared around me. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot about branding and knowing what you're standing for. So when it comes to, for instance, like my brand, I want to make sure that it's me. Right. And it's something that I can maintain. I can maintain who I am. Therefore, I can't add anything else that isn't me. So what I'm you, very conscious of that when what, I go into anything I post. So, like, what do you mean by if it's not you? Give me. So, like, like, like you said, makeup all the time. That's okay. not me. Oh. Hair done all the time. That's not me. Right, right, right. Different that things like it. that. That's not me. Booty pics. That's not me. These things that there are things that I do not do. So, therefore, to never be associated with my brand. I like that. So it's it's basically about you setting know, boundaries. That's it. That's very conscientious of you because um, inadvertently I, I tried to do this, but I didn't. I wouldn't have said it like that. Um, because I try to appeal to uh, my, my audience, um, mm-hmm. but I don't. I'm not provocative. I'm mm-hmm. not. I'm not a ranter. I don't rant. I only believe mm-hmm. in positive stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do find that my the way I always said it. And tell me how you see this. The way I always used to say it was, I want everything that I post. If I make a statement, or if I make, or even just a picture that because rep- it's going to represent me to a certain degree. I want it to be authentic to me. And one of the most common comments that I get. When I go to a show or go to an expo and people will be, oh, yeah, can I want to take a picture? Or they'll shake my hand. They'll say, I've been following you for a long time. And they'll go, wow, you're just like you are on social media. 
<laughs> I'm like, that's exactly I'm like, right. yeah, I'm like, yeah, well, I try to be really authentic. You know, I, I don't want to, and that's why people come to me. I just actually talked to a company that wanted me to represent their stuff and post their stuff. I said, look, I only, I don't want, I don't accept money to do that. Um, and I don't, because uh, I, I don't, so I don't want, I don't care about, so the, if I have a discount code or something, I'm not getting paid for it. It's for my, it's for the benefit of my followers. I said, so I'll, usually all I ask for is I only want the stuff that I use. Just right. give me this, as much as the stuff as I want that I use and I will be honest about my critique of it and I will put, put it out there and tell people about it. That's what I do. Now, yep. so I try to do that. So, it's, uh, so it sounds like that's kind of what you're saying that you kind of do. Yeah, very, very much. So especially when it comes to supplements, I just got a supplement sponsor. So I'm real clear. I take these supplements. Okay. So if right. you're going to ask me about it and I'll straight up tell them, have you, take, have you taken this? Nope, I haven't taken it. I can't <laughs> tell you anything about it. Love the company though. I, I don't know anything about that one. I said, I take A, B, C, and D. This is what I like about it. That's it. But <laughs> I'm not good. that way because that, that has boosted just my sales alone because people know I'm not lying to them. I'm not going to tell you to take that was why I, That's why I wanted to be authentic. <laughs> well, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to be authentic because once people don't trust you, like what can you... It's like, over. Yeah, and that's a per- to me. I relate that to character. So, like, yep. I want my my character is flawless. I am not gonna. I do not say things I don't do. I and I want to be honest. It's part of what how I grew up. You know, it was my my family was sort of a well, very sort of Southern Christian sort of like you know down home kind of place. And 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 we and that those were the core values. Even though today mm-hmm. I don't really claim to be very religious. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not really religious, but I'm a very spiritual person from a certain standpoint. And, and I'm very and I'm very conscientious of my own particular brand of morality, which is really mm-hmm. centers around spreading jo- love and joy. Period. Period. Okay, <laughs> in the most authentic, honest way that I can. Um, mm-hmm. And so I uh, and I really uh, and I want good for everybody. Yep. And, and, I, and I will not cast judgment. I am sorry. It is not my job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so and I want that to come across in my social media. But I also, so, but I, I, and I find that like you, I never thought about it until you said this. I find like that my audience is different. Um, so, and I like that. It's like, I don't, Me too. I, <laughs> I, I, I do get, and I, can't, I don't get like naked pictures of, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I'll get any of those. But, but, but I do get, uh, maybe I got like one or two in the past over the years, but it was over the years, but it was just, but um, uh, I didn't know these people, of course, but, um, but, but it's usually like people who are either like me, you know what I mean? I think that that resonate with me, or who are it, who, or where my message is touching. You know, there are real things, and I like that. Like, I don't think you need gazillion a gaz- to, You don't, to, and you don't need to appeal to everybody. I don't want to appeal. Yes, to everybody. Like, that, and the thing I'm really conscious of is because of all the things that I've done, my audience is it spans wider than a lot of other people. So for me, I have ten year old girls on my page. Like, I can't be posting F-bombs. I don't curse on social media. I can't, I'm very <laughs> conscious of that because I, through Survivor, like, I have a lot of little girls oh, wow. and their moms who follow me. I can't, I, I can't do that. That looks <laughs> crazy. Like, no. And so I'm very, very conscious of what I'm posting because of that simple fact. Like, these little girls are looking at me. When, and I know they are because I've been told. Now, when you're, um, now when you're 34 and you decide yeah. to have a child... Do you want? Yeah. Would you envision a boy or a girl? Oof. Just curious, because I wanted a girl. I be honest, and I, I got. And I, I got my girl. do think I want a girl I, because in this social climate, I pr- would prefer not to have to deal with as many <laughs> issues for a young black male. <laughs> <laughs> and that's too much stress for me. I just don't. I don't. I don't want. So, it. what would you tell her then? Just thinking ahead. It, it, let's just pretend social media continues its same sort of track. What would you tell her? How would you direct her in in that in this kind in, with social media in this kind of climate? One, she wouldn't have one. We're gonna start with that until I am sure that she's setting herself like years and years and years of grooming straight out the womb. I think um, that's smart. You're beautiful. You're smart. Well, mm-hmm. no, no. Let's change that order. You're smart. You're beautiful. You're strong. You're powerful by yourself. Right. And I would do years and years and years of that from what, by the time she would get an Instagram, it'd be like, what would they have in like elementary school now? That's too young. I would say she could have one by middle school, maybe, because that's when it gets a little funky and I, I would, she'd oh probably God. have one anyway without me even knowing she yeah, had yeah. one. You better off so, you know, better off you know. <laughs> exactly. Oh. But that first decade will be spent I on can't even drilling it. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, it's so hard. I, I, 
my daughter, she's going to turn 10 this summer, and uh, I take, I've taken a lot of effort because her mother is very different. Um, she doesn't, she's just different. I, I love her to death, but she's different when it comes to how she, her, her ideas about parenting, um, which are good, but they're just, um, I focus on that emotional side and that side of, of well-being. My, I have two messages. One, I love you, and that never changes. You're worthy, mm-hmm. you're worthy of that. Two, you're destined for greatness. You have mm-hmm. to believe it. It's like, and so if, I want her to know these things. I want her to know mm-hmm. these things without any, but without any with complete faith. Um, mm-hmm. Because that, if, I've always felt that, 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 that as a base, that was what I grew up with. My mother told mm-hmm. me those two things every day. Every day I went to bed, she tucked me and said, Dad, do you know how much I love you? Do you know that you're destined for greatness? And I, my, my mom, man, my mom was my God. Like she was yeah. like everything. So I was like, so I believed her, you know? So, <laughs> and so I, and when I would go to school and people would do stuff, that I didn't, that I knew was wrong, that I could, that I was not supposed to do, and they were like, "Hey, come on, like, take one." I was like, "Nope, I don't need to do that." And I didn't have any peer pressure. I felt zero peer pressure because I had this basis in love. I had this basis that I didn't have to be a part of another group. I had my group. Mm-hmm. My group is good. It's me. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and so that's tough these days. I mm-hmm. see it already because I, uh, you know, she's already at times like she wants to sort of try to be like some of her friends or something or. Uh, sometimes not it's not super heavy yet because I can see yeah. she, she tells me I was so proud she told me daddy she says I just wanted you to know how, how I, I feel so lucky that you're my daddy I was like oh Aww. man you're going to make me cry <laughs> 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 just, because you always spend time with me and you always um, talk to me and, uh, and I said well does, doesn't your friends daddies do that and she says no and I was like man that's sad I was like, <laughs> that starts a lot of the issues right there. Yeah, I know. It's like you got to, you know, parent, being a parent is more than just giving birth, being more than just yep. uh, giving your sperm. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's, you know, uh, contributing to this young person who needs your guidance. And I think yes. it's really important. Now, they're going to make it no matter what. Um, it's just how they end up making it. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I prefer them be as stress free as possible. <laughs> they start living life like Dawn. Let them, let, them, let them be a kid for a second. These did, days. Dawn. Did you, now, did you have a, did you, were you, are you tight with your dad? Um, I'm, I'm a mama's girl. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm very, me and my mama like this. Oh, good. Anywhere I am, she is. She didn't miss a show until Australia, like three years ago. That's the only one she's ever missed. Like, she was devastated. She didn't miss shows. And I've been competing for 13 years. She's never missed one. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, she, she's that, that. Yeah, no, she doesn't. Oh, that's cool. No, that's my mama. <laughs> Do you have a big family? You have a big family? No, it's just me, my mom, my dad, my sister. Oh, we wow. have a lot of like surrogate brothers and sisters. And they're all there. <laughs> they're all there in that Georgia, right? Yes. They're all oh, that's Georgia. nice. That's nice. Now, well, I know. I'm at, we're at hour 48. I, I don't want to take any more of your time. I know that you're busy and I, I don't want to bite into your, to your schedule. You're probably tied on your schedule. <laughs> I am. <laughs> but thank you so much, Sydney. What, what, where can people, people can reach you on your, on your social, on your uh, Instagram account. What, uh, give everybody, you know, you came up with this interesting moniker. Tell me where that comes <laughs> from. Cause I was like, every time I always, I'm like vitamin C, like what, how does this work? Tell me, tell me about this. How this come about? So it's so <laughs> random. It was like right after I got my pro card at Nationals in 2012, and I was like, oh, I gotta come up with a name. And so I was like, huh, huh? What goes with C? And I was like, vitamin C. And so I typed it in. Somebody already had it, and I was like, boo. And so I was like, okay, just change the I to a Y, and then I got it. Oh and really? So, and my friend was like, "That's so corny," and I was like, "Well, I'm putting it anyway." <laughs> and everybody loves it. Well, here's a, here's a side here's a side note. Um, so I was a. Do you know who Linus Pauling is? No. So Linus Pauling uh, won a Nobel Prize in biochemistry for much of his work in vitamin C. He okay. actually went to he he his alma mater is mine. By Oregon State okay. University, so I went to Oregon State in my undergraduate, his, and I and I loved his research because I used to manage a vitamin store for about five six years when I was in college, and I uh, and I would and I believed in his research. He he was the first person to say vitamin C is healthy for you. It'll, it's mm-hmm. anti carcinogen. It'll help you boost your immune system. And he believed in mega dosing. So I mega dosed vitamin C for over twenty five years. I take mm-hmm. six to, six to eight grams a day for twenty five years. I got sick probably six seven times in the last twenty five years. 
So mm-hmm. like, I really just don't get sick. But I, I don't attribute it all to that. I actually attribute it to my smile. I think when you smile and you're happy, <laughs> it's true. good. Like when you have a good vibration, man, your cells work good. Don't don't <laughs> you don't have to believe me, but miserable people are sicker more. <laughs> That's true. That is true. <laughs> so, but um, but so it's kind of funny that you that your that your uh, little moniker is vitamin C because I the first thing that popped in my head was oh man, like because he ended up giving his Nobel Prize because he died. He died at ninety something years old. Uh, a couple years later, and he gave his his wife donated that Nobel Prize to Oregon State University that hangs in one of the halls, uh, which is pretty cool. So, uh, <laughs> this is kind of a funny story. <laughs> that is cool. I was always curious about that, but all right, well, yeah, I wanted something health related. I was like, yeah, okay. that works out, and I, I take a lot of vitamin C too. So yeah. So, <laughs> so now you're so you're, you'll be at the Arnold. Yes. And you're competing. <laughs> yes, I am. And uh, and then after that, you're just going to take the time to the to the Olympia. Yep. Okay, Sit good. it on down. Well, good luck at the Arnold. I don't think I need to wish you good luck. I think it's going to be a great show for you. And uh, you feel good? Yeah. Yeah, good. Ready to get on there and eat some pizza. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I will definitely see you there. I'll see you backstage. I'll see you there. I'll say hi. We'll take a picture. I always love taking of pictures course. with you. And then uh, hang on. Hang on. When, when I stop the recording, hang on for just two seconds before we leave. But thank you so much for being on the show. And after you win Olympia again, then I'll have you on again. And we'll talk about that. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> thank and- you. Handle your high with Daddy Yoshi.